Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Just Paul, I have to excuse myself at 10 o'clock for a funeral. I understand. Yeah. You're going to 10. Okay. We got a few minutes here before the meeting starts, so you can just enjoy my pretty picture before we do. Good morning, Kobe. Good morning, Luke. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. You feeling better? Um, a little bit. <laughs> gotcha. Better than last week. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. I didn't know I was, I, I had a link here that came in an email this morning that said join as a panelist. So I hope that was, that was okay. I went, oh man. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, right. we, we, we like having you on, you know, available if there's any questions, but understand if, if you want to turn off your video and then work on a few things while you're listening in, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I got a few, uh, a few hot ones from Diane to take care sure. of here this morning. So I will, yeah, I will probably, right I'll probably do that. But if you guys need, feel the need for me, just holler at me and I'll show my video and unmute and okay. be on there Sounds to, good. you know, help out with anything you might need. All right. Thank you. Luke. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Morning, Paul. Hey, good morning, Bruce. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Feeling better? Well, yeah, I am. Good. How's everybody? Getting ready for March Madness? I love it. Yeah. It's one of the best tournaments ever going around, I think. Well, I, I think you're going to want me on the on your group of betting this year because I haven't watched a basketball game yet. So, well, well Kobe, I, I'm not far behind you. I have to say, it was only over the last weekend I watched a few. So, uh, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be autofill on the ESPN um, uh, brackets. I think we'll see where we go. Yeah. Right. Right. Apart from World Cup, I have to say that World Cup is the other other one that I just uh, think is a fantastic it's tournament. It's underway now, is it, or no? No. No, not yet. No. Okay. I'm just watching uh, just watching all those oligarch uh, Premier League um, uh, clubs go down. So at this point in time, over in the UK, yeah. very interesting. I have to ask you what you what do you think will happen with uh, Chelsea? Gee, I reckon you know I've got a really good mate who uh, is a member of Chelsea, and he went to pay his membership, and they've frozen them. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think they've got to have, probably government will have to bail them out from the cash flow perspective, and then they'll go bankrupt. I think in in a month. So, because they said that they weren't going to let Abramovich or whatever his name is sell the team anymore, not going to let him sell it. And if he does sell it, the proceeds will go to some sort of charity, which is three billion. So, um, so they've frozen that sale to anybody else, and they've frozen players' transfers. The club's a mess, they, they don't even know where they can hop on a plane. And travel right now with their, with their budget. Yeah, I hate to cut everybody off here. Let's we're getting we're at nine o'clock here for our planning commission Good. meeting. Um, let me see who's all 
we have a quorum. So we got Commissioner Rojas, Enders, Allender, Crowell. Um, looks like we're still missing uh, Hill and uh, Beasley. So we have two that's going to be out today, uh, Commissioner Baker and uh, Commissioner Sadowski. I think we've got a quorum of, of four here. Is Sarah available? I don't see her on yet. Okay. All right, there's Commissioner Beasley. Hopefully Sarah will join us here in a second. I think we can kind of start through our announcements, can't we, Joe, just to get started without Sarah? Or do you want to check? Um, no, we can go ahead and start with that. I'm pretty sure she'll jump in in the next couple minutes. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and start our meeting today. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to the March 15th, 2022 City Planning Commission meeting. It's really nice to see everybody. Uh, we're definitely the cool kids here as we hold our planning commission virtually while others are out on spring break. So one of the values of this commission is that all commissioners understand every project is important and unique. In addition, we want to make sure that we address all the projects individually with the attention that they need to build consensus between the applicant, public, and city staff. Uh, the commissioners believe in this virtual world, we can reach consensus by being brief yet heard. Uh, therefore, we do have some time limits in place for the cases that we hear, which is five minutes for staff presentations, um, and that doesn't count for um, agenda items one and two today, um, and 20 minutes for applicant presentations plus questions by the commissioners. Uh, when we move to public comment, please limit uh, comments to two minutes when speaking as an individual or up to five minutes when representing a community association or larger group. Um, the city is updating the comprehensive plan uh, titled Casey Spirit Playbook. Uh, lots of information is available, including a draft report. Uh, we're gonna hear about that more today, and I believe as part of agenda item number two. So uh, looking forward to that. As we get started, I ask uh, staff briefly provide some ground rules and instructions for all of us to ensure that we have minimal disruption and, and maximum clarity uh, during our meeting. So Joe, if you don't mind reminding us of those ground rules, please. I sure appreciate it. Sure. Um, so basically um, everyone in this in Zoom right now, um, joining us in Zoom as a participant and their participants are broken up into two categories. We have panelists, which are the rectangular boxes you see on your screen and attendees. And um, the panelists currently are just staff and the commissioners. Um, when a case is called um, by, uh, I, I read it off. Uh, if you're the applicant, go ahead and raise your hand as I'm reading it. And we will promote you from the attendee list to the panelist list. Um, the same is true if you're uh, a citizen just wishing to provide testimony during the public hearing on any case, you may do the same um, as the planner or the applicant are presenting the project to the commission, um, please raise your hand and we'll promote you. Um, when you are promoted, it may appear as though you're being um, kicked out, but you will rejoin us um, very quickly as a panelist. Um, and also once you're in as a panelist, please make sure you're muted um, until you're ready to speak. You will have control at that time over your own audio and video. So um, the commission does appreciate if you have the, uh, option of turning on video that you turn that on um, and then of course turn on your audio when you're ready to speak when you're done please mute yourself so we don't pick up your background noise and um, the last thing is the chat feature is intended just to ask questions about where we are at on the docket as well as technological questions it's not to be used to provide testimony regarding the merits of any other projects today and that's it mr chair thank you all right, thank you, Joe. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead. It looks like uh, Commissioner Hill's here now, as well as uh, Sarah. So we're got everybody here. And let's start with our consent agenda items, beginning with cases that will be continued. 
All right, our continued cases on consent are docket item C5, and that's the only one. Case number CPC 2022-00008. Request to approve a final plan in District MPD on at Tiffany Square East, Lot 3, to allow for the construction of a restaurant on about one acre at the northeast corner of North Ambassador Drive and Northwest 88th Street. Uh, the applicant is requesting continuance of this to April 5th, and staff recommends no fee. Okay, are there any questions for the continuance uh, regarding docket item C5 from the commission? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. So if there's anybody from the public that would like to speak about the continuance of docket item C5, please raise your hand. Mr. Chair, no one's raising their hand. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public testimony then on that docket item. And I'll take a motion, please. Chair Crowell, I move to continue docket item C5 to April 5th without fee. Second. Okay, so I've got a motion and a second for continuance of docket item C5. Uh, Lisa, if you're available, can you take roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crowell? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. And Rojas? Aye. Okay, it looks like the motion passes six to none for continuance of docket item C5. All right, let's go ahead and open up the other uh, consent agenda items, please. Okay. Docket item C1 is case number final plat 2022 0008. Request to approve a final plat for Tremont Square East in District B3-3 to create four commercial lots at the northeast corner of North Chatham and Northwest Prairie View Road. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. Docket item C2, case number final plat 2022-00007. A re request to approve a final plat in District UR for the Blue River Commerce Center on about 14 acres at the northeast corner of Bannister and Troost, creating one commercial lot. Staff recommends approval with conditions. Docket item C3, case number final plat 2022 Request to approve a final plat in district R80 for Harmon Acres, creating two residential lots at the northeast corner of Northeast 92nd and North, North Brooklyn Avenue. Staff recommends approval with conditions. And docket item C4, case number CPC 2022 0016. A request to approve a project plan for the Premier Truck Group in District M1-5 on about four and a half acres at the southeast corner of Parvin Road and North Randolph Road. Staff recommends approval of conditions with that one as well. And that concludes the consent docket. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. C6, case number CPC 2022-00011. A request to approve a project plan for the Wood Springs Suite Hotel on about two acres located about 50 feet north of Northwest Prairie View Road and 300 feet east of North Chatham Avenue. Staff is recommending approval with conditions of that one as well. Okay, thank you, Joe. Any questions from the commission regarding any of these docket items? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I've got a, a question and, a, and, a, and a, a comment. So I see for the landscaping and screening, when is that, when is that due in the in the process, I understand that that hasn't been approved or submitted yet. That's docket item C4, is that yep. correct? Yeah. Okay. Also, can you, can you help with that, please? What are the questions, Mr. Allender? Uh, I understand the landscaping and screening plan hasn't been submitted yeah, so when is that going to be submitted as part of the development? It will be submitted prior to uh, issue as a building permit. Okay. And prior to approving, uh, stamping approved this uh, project plan. So. And then my comment on C6. Is we'll and the there you go. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Yeah, sorry, I'll get close to the computer. Um, so I just want to make a comment on C6. I really appreciate the incorporation of the green stormwater green infrastructure 
into the plan on C6 on the Woods, Wood Springs Suites, rain gardens and infiltration basins. Really, really, uh, I think that looks really great. So uh, I just wanted to shout, to give a shout out to the developer and the, and the applicant on that. Okay. Um, I had a question on uh, docket item C3. Um, on the page three, there's talk about requested deviations at the top. Can you remind me, do we have any deviations on this project? Uh, those deviations were granted by the preliminary plot um, that was approved by city council. Okay, so really this whole paragraph, we don't need it in the staff report or you, you need to keep that? Uh, we don't need it in the staff report. Okay. We'll, we'll make sure that once uh, it goes through that those, uh, I think it was just for public improvement, half street improvement that was waived by uh, city council with the preliminary plan. Okay. And then so uh, that up and make sure it's done before we go forward. Okay. And then uh, C6, um, what's immediately west of there? Has there been anything planned on, on that or do we know? Yeah, uh, to the west of the hotel is a pet, um, like a pet uh, daycare facility, okay. boarding facility. That's you guys approve. I believe. You, I don't know if Naj was on. She worked on it. I think that you guys have approved that already, but recently it was just okay. in the past couple of months. Okay, I couldn't remember. Yeah, and you approved a car wash to the north of this about four months ago, maybe. Okay, gotcha. Very good. Is that um, right, Najma, on the approval for the pet suites? Can't hear you. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me there now? you go. Yeah. Yep. I think there's okay, now I can't hear you, but that's okay. Yes, that is correct for the pet suites. Okay. Okay, any other questions from the commission regarding uh, docket items C1, C2, C3, C4, or C6? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. If there's anybody out there that would like to speak regarding those uh, cases that are open, please raise your hand and you will be called upon. Mr. Chair, no one's raising their hand. Okay, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close public testimony and I will take a motion, please. Chair Corral, I move to um, approve with conditions docket items C1, C2, C3, C4, and C6 uh, with the conditions as stated in the staff reports. C1, 2, C3. Okay. I've got a motion. Do I have a second? A second. All right. So I have a motion and a second for approval of docket items C1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Lisa, can you take roll call on that motion, please? Mm hmm. Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow? Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. And Rojas? Aye. Okay, looks like the motion passes uh, six to none for approval of those cases. Uh, good luck as you guys move forward on those. All right, so let's move to our regular agenda items, uh, beginning with the cases that will be continued to a future meeting. All right, um, the first one for continuance is docket item three, case number CPC 2022-00009. The request to approve a rezoning from district R7.5 to district MPD and a preliminary plan, which acts as a preliminary plat for the 115th and Holmes MPD development, which is located at the Southeast corner of East 115th Street and Holmes Road to allow 34 multiplex units. The applicant is requesting continuance of this case to April 19th. Next continuance is docket item 6.1, case number CPC 2022-00006, a request to approve an amendment to the Greater Downtown Area Plan to change the recommended land use from residential low density to residential high and mixed use neighborhood on about half an acre at 1015 Pacific Street in docket item 6.2, which is companion, 
a request to approve a rezoning from District R 1.5 to District U R with an associated development plan, which also acts as a preliminary plat for the Pacific Intrus project at the same location. The applicant is requesting continuance of this case to April 19th as well, and staff recommends no fee in both cases. Next continuance is docket item nine, case number CPC 2021-00197, a request to detach a portion of the city of Kansas City so that it may be annexed in the city of Belton for the Belton Golf Course, um, which is about 103 acres in size and located at 4200 Bong Avenue. Uh, the applicant in this case, which is the city of Belton, is requesting continuance to April 19th. Staff recommends no fee. Next continuance is docket item 11, case number CPC 2021-00168. This is a request to approve a rezoning from District R80 to District MPD and approve a preliminary development plan um, to bring an existing land, landscape business into compliance with the zoning ordinance. It's located at 8300 North Green Hills Road. Staff is recommended and the applicant has agreed to a continuance to April 5th without fee. And then the last continuance is docket item 13, case number CPC 2021-00186, amending chapter 88, the zoning and development code through revisions, clarifications, and other administrative changes throughout the chapter in accordance with periodic review. Staff is requesting a continuance of this case to April 19th without fee. Okay, thank you, Joe. Couple questions. Um, on 6.1 and 6.2, the docket is saying continuance with a fee, and I believe you're saying uh, with no fee. So just want to confirm that. That's correct. With no, without fee. Without fee. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, number 13, it says continuance with a fee as well. And that's with also without a fee. That's without a fee because we're the applicant. <laughs> that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, uh, any questions from the commission regarding continuance of docket items three, 6.1, 6 6.2, 9, 11, or 13? Okay, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. If there's anybody out there from the public that would like to speak about the continuance of these docket items, please raise your hands and or hand and uh, you'll be called upon. Mr. Chair, no one's raising their hand. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and close public testimony then. And then uh, I'll take a motion, please, for the continuance of those cases. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, number 11 was changed to, a con uh, to April 19th. All right. Instead of April 5th. Chair Crowell, are you ready for the motion? Uh, yes, please. Let's just make sure. So docket item 11 is to continue to April 19th. Okay. Got it. Anna, is that correct? Just that is correct. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'll take the motion. Uh, All right. Chair Crowell, I move to continue docket items um, 3, 6.1, 6.2, 9, and 13 without fee to the date stated in the docket and to continue docket item number 11 without fee to April 19th. Okay, do I have second. a second? Second. So I've got a motion and a, consent and a second for continuance of docket items three, six, one, six, two, nine, eleven, 11, and 13. Uh, Lisa, can you take roll call on the motion, please? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow. Aye. Enders? Aye. Hill? Aye. And Rojas? Aye. All right. Looks like the motion passes for the continuance of those cases. Uh, with that, uh, let's go back to agenda item number one. Uh, looking forward to the presentations here that we have for the agenda items one and two. Agenda item number one is case number MISC for miscellaneous 2022-00003. And we have on the line Justin Peterson from the city's Parks and Recreation Department that will be um, providing you all with some information regarding the department's impact fees. 
And I'll turn it over to Justin now. Thanks for joining us, Justin. Good morning, uh, Commission. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I was just going to give a quick presentation and kind of go over the parkland dedication um, requirements. Um, what's the formula behind it, how it's calculated, and then the options available for developers um, to choose from it to satisfy these requirements. Let's see. So here's the applicability section uh, for parkland dedication. And so it says in subdividing land, re-subdividing existing plat, or otherwise creating any new residential units, a developer must provide suitable sites for parks, playgrounds, or other public or private recreational areas or open space. This parkland requirement may be met by dedication of land to the city for park purposes, platting or private open space tracks for recreational purposes per an approved plan or payment in lieu of or any combination thereof. So the developer really has three options. They can dedicate land to the city for park uses. That means it's, a dot, that means it's accepted by the parks board and um, now is under parks maintenance. Um, I'd say this is probably the least likely option used. Um, in my time here, I've only had it um, been involved in one scenario where it was being used, and that was just a few months ago up near the Twin Creeks area. Aside from that, I haven't um, been involved in that option being used um, prior. Um, the second option is platting and dedicating private open space. And then the third option is paying a money, a, a money in lieu of fee and um, instead of dedicating land. And so here's the formula for calculating um, the acres that would be required um, to satisfy these requirements. And so I'll just go through each factor individually. Um, and so the formula, the primary factor is the number of units they're proposing. Um, and so that could be platting a new subdivision, building an apartment complex, um, even splitting um, a single family home into two lots. Um, that's, and this applies for any time new residential units are, are being proposed. Um, exclusions, that would be for short-term rentals or hotels. We don't um, factor those into this, into requiring uh, parkland dedication. And so the second unit is persons per unit. Um, and this is a, a factor based on the type of residential um, units that they're proposing. And so a 3.7 factor would be used for single family dwelling. 3.0 would be used for two unit houses or duplexes. And then 2.0 factor would be used for multifamily residential. And so you can see here's the total formula. We plug in the number of units, um, the unit type that they're proposing. And then the next one I'll go into is acres per person. Acres per person is 0 0.006. This is a set number and it remains the same um, in any given, um, scenario for new residential units, the number of units, persons per unit times 0 0.006, and that equals the acres that they're required to either dedicate um, or we use to calculate the money in lieu of fee. Um, and so here's a couple examples of how that formula would lay out um, given a, um, some scenarios here. So say they're platting a new 145 unit single family subdivision we'd plug in the number of units, 145. We'd use a factor of 3.7 for single family. And then again, 0 0.006, that remains consistent throughout the formula. And so 145 uh, lot single family subdivision would be required to dedicate 3.219 acres. Um, another scenario would be a new 95 unit apartment complex. Again, you would plug in the number of units. For apartments, that would be a factor of 2.0 times 00 0.006, and they would be required to dedicate 1.14 acres. And so option one, um, like we said, you can dedicate land to the city, plat private open space, or pay money in lieu of fee. Option number one, um, dedicating land to the city. And so here are a couple of um, the language behind dedicating that. And so the dedication of land for park purposes must be at locations designated in the comprehensive plan, official parks plan adopted by the Parks Board of Recreation and Commissioners, or as determined by the developer and staff of city planning and parks and rec. Um, all the land dedicated to the city must have board approval um, and it must be um, dedicated and shown on the plat 
um, for this project that it's dedicated to Kansas City, Missouri um, for park purposes. If unable to agree on land dedication, developer must pay a money in lieu of, and if land is less than two acres, the city may elect to require the developer to pay money in lieu of. And again, I would say this is the least um, likely option chosen. Option number two would be dedication of private open space. Um, we require that private open space be platted into a private open space tract and the tract must be improved to provide for recreational and amenity features for those um, future residents. Um, open space is maintained by the developer or the lot owners in the subdivision as private property. Um, and then we require a final plan to be submitted and approved by staff um, detailing what kind of amenities that they're proposing um, in those tracks. And that can include playgrounds, uh, dog parks, shelters, athletic fields, pools, picnic tables, benches, um, trails. You know, we, we provide flexibility um, uh, for the developer to propose um, as they should choose. Um, and the plan must be approved prior to recording the plat. The option number three would be paying the money in lieu of fee. And so that's basically taking the required acres um, that they get from that formula we went over times the parkland rate. And so the parkland rate is the average cost per acre actually paid by the city for all purchases or tracts of parkland of 49 acres or less, whether through negotiation or condemnation, but excluding all acquisitions wholly or partially obtained through gift during the five calendar years immediately preceding the subject calendar year. And um, when we're assessing these fees, if it's a single family subdivision, um, if they choose to do the money in lieu of that needs to be taken care of prior to recording their final plat, or if it's an apartment building, um, we require that to be satisfied prior to getting their certificate of occupancy. And so here's a, a little snip of like the 2021 rate so you can get an idea of how it was calculated. And so for the 2021 rate, we take the previous five years and look through the um, land that was purchased by the parks department, um, the acres and the cost. And you would take those five previous years, total those up. Um, as you can see, the five previous years um, from 2021 was 11.68 and that was the total um, dollar amount spent to acquire that amount, those acres, um, you would take the total amount divided by the acres and that would give you the parkland rate. And so that was, this was the 2021 parkland rate. Uh, the current issue we're facing is that the parkland rate is based on land purchased by the parks department. Um, and the parks board and our management have indicated that there'll be less to no purchasing of land due to maintenance concerns. And obviously that impacts um, this parkland rate um, significantly. And so you can see um, for 2022, the 2016 purchases were fallen off and that remains us with one um, purchase in 2018 that is driving this parkland rate. As you can see, when you total that out, the rate significant, um, significantly increases. Um, and just to give you an idea of the maintenance concerns that they were having, I looked through our reference book just to kind of get an idea and provide you with some numbers. Um, and so the parks board or the parks department manages 12,000 acres, and that includes 221 parks and 135 miles of parkways and boulevards. Um, and this in also includes 48 fountains throughout the city, 122 monuments, eight museums, and 10 community centers. And so um, their concerns um, with maintenance has kind of driven down this land. And so we're really looking to find an alternative way of calculating this because um, obviously it bumped up in 2022 to this 64,000. And then in a few years when that 2019 rate drops off, now the parkland rate's gonna be zero. So. Um, within the next few weeks, we are likely going to be um, putting out an RFQ um, to find a, a team to look at um, how the rate is currently calculated, as well as come up with an alternative solution on how we can um, calculate the parkland rate moving forward. Um, this team will um, we'll be asking them to reach out to community and neighborhood leaders, as well as the development community, um, and look for ways of um, 
how we can recalculate this. One option that we kind of have in mind, if, if we're not going to be buying new land, maybe the, the current parkland that we have um, is assessed, you know, every five years, maybe random parks are chosen um, from different council districts and then averaged. Um, that's one option, but we're kind of leaving it up to the team um, to kind of see where it goes. Um, but that'll be um, kind of coming online and they'll be getting started on that after we select someone and move forward within the coming months. Um, I think that is all I have. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to kind of help answer. Uh, sure. Uh, just a couple of questions. Justin, how, how do you determine uh, as money is collected, where does, where does the money go? How do you determine where the money is supposed to go for what park and, and sure. uh, how it's spent? Sure. Anytime someone pays a money in lieu of fee, we track all those geographically by the project and those funds must be used within three miles of the project um, that paid that, that money in lieu of fee. So it's all reserved into an account and it has to be used within three miles. We make every attempt to use it um, for an improvement within a park as close as possible, but as the code states, it's three miles. Is, is there a time frame of which you uh, need to spend it? And is it generally on capital improvements or is it maintenance or both? Um, it can be both. I believe it is 15 years um, that the funds would have to be paid by. Okay. Is there always a, pro uh, a park within three miles? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not really involved in actually distributing those funds, um, so I can't say with certainty, um, but I know there are um, areas where, you know, funds may sit for a longer period of time if there's less improvements or less available, you know, opportunities within that area, um, regardless, they have to be um, used on something, but I, I'm not aware of a, a situation where um, there wasn't a park within three miles. Can you give us a sense of the fee revenue over the past five years generated by this? I do not have that information. That's kind of all kept in our finance groups. Um, uh, that's where the funding goes. They go into their account. And I, I, I don't think I have access to it, but it might be something I can distribute out. I'll have to check. And I guess um, another way of asking a similar question um, in the effort to find a new way to calculate it, is it main, Is the main concern coming up with something that's fair and equitable in lieu of having past purchases? Or is the main reason because, or is, is one of the other reasons also because the parks department is very reliant upon this funding based upon uh, the budgetary concerns you talked about? Um, I would say that the parks department is pretty reliant on these. Um, developer allotment funds. Um, and we also understand that we want this to not get out of hand. Um, one thing we are trying to do currently is trying to hold it at the 2021 rate, because um, we understand that was a significant bump up to the 64,000. So um, we're, we're trying to come up with a way to hold it at the 2021 rate right now. And then moving forward in the future, come up with a way to um, be more equitable to everyone involved. Sorry, one, one more question, and this is for any staff member. I feel as though this is, um, besides what you're talking about in terms of needing a new way to calculate this, it's something that we hear a lot about, but I've, I personally feel as though we don't hear a lot of complaints about the process or anything. Is it generally deemed to be expensive by developers who develop in multiple places, or is it deemed to be relatively middle of the road? Is it pretty standard? Um, I would say it's pretty common um, to get complaints about the amounts uh, <laughs> and they come directly to me, but it's something, it's, it's kind of like an impact fee where no one has the ability to waive it. You know, they can't go to city council and ask to be waived. And after we kind of tell them that, then it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a mute point at that. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. This is very helpful. Justin, just on the parkland rate, does that include infrastructure improvements when you look at the, the cost of that? Like curb and gutters for streets and, and so forth? 
Um, I, it is, it's not used in curb and gutters, but say if it was a trail along um, a parkway or boulevard, I believe it could be used for that. And, but is that incorporated in the cost per acre? Um, the park room? Could you ask that again? I'm not sure I understand what your question well, is. Well, I, I just, I think there's a couple of cases that have come up where we've had a parkland rate, but there's been, you know, uh, the city's required to do some infrastructure improvements. Um, and I was just wondering whether the, the parkland rate takes it account of the infrastructure improvements of that property? Um, if, if I understand uh, the question, I think what you were saying is that the, it's only the purchase price. And so if the, park, or if the parks department in the city were to purchase a park um, and had to improve it to get it up to a standard that makes it a usable park, that cost is not captured. It's just the cost of acquiring the land, not adding the street to the park or adding the infrastructure for the park. I'm not sure, Commissioner Allender, if that was kind of what you're... you're... Yeah, I think there's a couple of cases where we had and really early, I think, when we first were on the commission on, on the question of what was included in the parkland rate. And I'm just trying to get a sense of that. It would have been just the cost of acquiring that land. Okay. It would not include any um, improvements to be made after. It would just be the cost of that land is what goes into the parkland rate. Is there any thought on infrastructure improvements being put into a into a parkland parkland right? I don't think it's out of the question. Um, we're really hoping um, when we get a team and get them on board. Um, we can come up with some good solutions moving forward and hopefully we'll get some good feedback from, you know, community neighborhood leaders, neighborhood associations. We're planning on reaching out to a number of groups. Obviously they're going to probably want the fees to be higher. And then the development community is going to want the fees to be as low as possible. So it's all about finding that balance. It's something that works for um, both parties. Right. No, thank, thanks for that. I just, uh, thanks for that clarification. Okay. Thanks commissioner Anders for interpreting my question. Any other questions from the commission for Justin? Um, I'm sorry, I was trying to get off. Uh, um, I you, saw you. You saw me. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I'm tracking what's being said, this is kind of like the impact fee. It has to be used within the area in which it was collected. But if there are no parks within the three mile radius, what happens to that funding? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm just not aware of a scenario where that has actually happened. So we've acquired more parks up north and I'm, my mind is going so many different ways right now because I'm thinking budgetarily the parks department has kind of separated itself from the city by having different fees that are coming in. So if you're collecting this as an effort to do park maintenance, there's nothing in the works to just do park maintenance period. Because I'm thinking you've got areas of the cities that do have established parks that don't have new development where they would be able to get this type of fee in lieu of to be used in the parks that were within that area. So has there been any discussion in reviewing this, this process? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point that you made. Um, a lot of this parkland dedication, it's all triggered around new development or redevelopment. Um, and so you see a lot of the funds that come in are around where the city is growing. Um, and this is just one avenue stream that the Parks Department has. There's PIAC fans and another, a number of other funds that are available. Um, but you're right, the, the only real options where um, in say older areas that are already developed, 
um, parkland dedication would be required, say if they were, um, uh, you know, re-subdividing lands or, um, you know, building, you know, redeveloping an area, it would be triggered. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, you could, it's, it's definitely the way it's kind of written with these parkland dedications is that it's kind of triggered around where these new residential units are being added. Um, so, yeah. And if I was following correctly, even though it is a single home subdivision development that each home does have green space to it, we still require them to dedicate money for parks in lieu of. I did track that right in what you presented. Well, if, if they want to satisfy the parkland dedication requirements, they would have to plat any open space into um, a tract. And so they wouldn't just be able to, like if it was a single family house, they couldn't say, well, my front yard is green and my backyard is green. That's going to serve my open space. That wouldn't um, meet those requirements. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but any land that they're wanting to dedicate would need to be platted into a tract. So that way it couldn't be developed in the future because that tract now serves a purpose, a recreational purpose for that development. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Kind of, sort of, because I'm thinking I can, I can, really understand when you're looking at multifamily that may not be able to have as much green space based upon the density but when you're doing a single family home they have yards so why are we requiring them to dedicate parkland or green space in lieu of that would really be to provide an opportunity for um you know maybe a dog park in that subdivision or a trail that would loop around that area um community, uh, you know, like the clubhouse with the pool, we would credit that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Any right, that brought up, go ahead. Up one more for me. Um, when, if you uh, happen to know, when did the Parkland dedication fee um, start? 1970. Cool, thanks. That was a good year, by the way, Commissioner Enders. Um, okay, any other questions from the uh, commission? <clears throat> uh, just a last thought, uh, Justin, is I'm looking forward to someday when the Parks Department will have a, uh, you know, following with Commissioner Beasley, a, a nice park up north, uh, similar to Loose Park uh, down south. So I think we need one of those up there at some point in time. That's my opinion. I will pass that on. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close uh, or end docket item number one. I don't think there's any reason to go any, any public comment or questions on that because we're not acting on anything. So um, if there's anybody that would like to comment about the parkland fee, I'm sure you can reach out to Justin uh, as needed um, with, you know, by email or phone call. So, all right. So with that, let's go ahead and go to docket item number two, Joe. Docket item two is case number MISC 2022-00001, the KC Spirit Playbook. And I believe we have Gerald Williams and Morgan Pemberton on the line to uh, present some information about the status of the comprehensive plan to you guys. I'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, All right. Gerald. Thanks, Joe. Uh, hi, I'm Gerald Williams, Long Range Planning Division, uh, managing the comprehensive plan update. And as Joe said today, here, here with me is Morgan Pemberton, also helping to manage this process. And uh, Kyle Elliott, who is our division manager, is on vacation this week. Otherwise, he would be here as well. Uh, but I just want to mention him uh, also. So, uh, so we're here today to give you an update on our comprehensive plan uh, update process. Um, and we're also open to ideas about any future presentations and any information you'd like to have that we don't cover today. Uh, today is really about uh, covering the process so far, what we've done, and kind of where we're going from here. Uh, so, uh, so anybody be thinking about what, what else you'd like us to, to, uh, to be conveying to you all. Uh, so this is our comprehensive plan. As as uh, as a commissioner uh, uh, Kraus said earlier, uh, it's the Casey Spirit Playbook. Uh, that's that's the name of our new comprehensive plan. And uh, next slide. 
And uh, so this is um, this is a plan for the next 20 years for the city. It was, it's it's, it's going to guide the physical development of our city uh, for the next two decades. Our existing a comprehensive plan has been in place since 1997. It's called the Focus Kansas City Plan. Uh, it was kind of a very cutting edge, a, a highly recognized award-winning plan at the time. And it's still, uh, as we're finding, uh, as we're going through that plan and pulling relevant elements of it into the new plan, uh, we're finding that it's still, still very good, still very relevant. Uh, next slide. So we've been doing this now uh, for, for about two years. Uh, we, we started pre-planning, you know, in 2019, really in, in earnest in, in early 2020 and right about the time the pandemic hit, uh, we were planning a major uh, public engagement process and a, and a huge in-person uh, kickoff event in April of 2020, which was promptly canceled uh, due to the pandemic. And we've been in the virtual environment pretty much since then. We have been out in the community. We'll talk about that in a moment in, in, in some in-person events. Uh, we've gotten uh, lots of paper surveys and things like that, which I think is fairly remarkable given the, uh, the limitations of the, of the pandemic. But and I'll talk through the process in, in a little more detail in just a moment. But this, this gives you some idea where, 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 where uh, you can see the you are here uh, uh, circle there, uh, which shows you that we're kind of nearing the end of this process. Uh, we are in the, in the stage now where we are having, wrapping up really our recommendations, public meetings about how, what strategies and recommendations we want to have, and we are beginning to write the draft plan. Uh, we hope to have that ready for, for your consideration uh, sometime later this year. Uh, next slide, I think I hand it over to Morgan for a couple of slides here. Morgan, I think you're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. All right, I had the wrong microphone setting. Uh, all right, so we'll give you a little bit more information here on the public engagement that we have been doing over the last two years. On your screen, there is uh, just some snapshots taken from our website showing the amount of content that we have generated um, in the last 24 months. We have um, introduction guides for people who have not been able to get engaged so far. We have all of our uh, online activities, our surveys, our mapping exercises. We have a page for each of our strategy session topic areas, which we'll go into in a little bit here. Um, livability, serviceability, visibility, mobility, they all have their own page uh, where you can find recordings of the meetings, you can find summaries of the feedback received at those meetings, and you can find all of the surveying that we actually did in our strategy sessions there as well. For anyone who was unable to attend any of those sessions, they can go to those pages and still participate in all of the questions that we asked people who are in attendance. We've also been sharing the website with our Climate Protection and Resiliency Plan team. They are about to wrap up their processes um, in the next few months as well. And um, yeah, we just have a lot of stuff on the website for people to go and still get engaged. Even though we're in these late stages, we still encourage everyone to go to the website, um, participate in these surveys um, if they can. We did make a mega survey that we've been sending out through our weekly newsletters that uh, encompasses every survey question asked at any of our strategy session public meetings. Uh, so if anyone uh, still wants to participate, uh, we're trying to keep that uh, window open as long as possible. And then uh, for the engagement that we've been doing to try and drive people to the website to get people to come to our public meetings, it all started, you know, with uh, creating the branding, uh, putting together data books, so people had a lot of information about the topic areas and the background uh, in Kansas City over the last 20 years, how those policy areas have evolved. We started out with thousands of emails to all of our department contacts, all of the neighborhood leader contacts that the city has on file. We've handed out flyers all over the city and other informational materials, uh, particularly the libraries have been a really big uh, help with getting those paper materials in front of people who uh, are visiting the libraries. We've done tons of presentations such as this one, uh, at least 
70 or so over the last two years, we're going to have another round where we're probably going to do, um, probably going to double that number as we get ready to roll out the draft plan later this summer. So we'll be doing a lot more public meetings. Uh, those are going to continue uh, over the next several months. Um, like I said, we do weekly newsletters, uh, social media posts. We've been trying to utilize all of our city social media outlets as efficiently and effectively as possible. We participated in some of the weekly report videos. We have put uh, ads on buses and in billboards around the city. We added some insert advertisements in everybody's water bill uh, twice in the last couple of years. So you may have seen that in your water bill if you receive the paper version. And our public engagement consultants have also helped us massively with attending in-person events outdoors once it was safe uh, to do so. They've also been putting together toolkits to send to our stakeholders so that they can help to spread the word about the plan and how to get engaged. And uh, we've also uh, put some advertisements in a couple of different language, uh, print and media sources. So we've been trying to be as creative as possible in how we can get people engaged when we for the most part of this process have not been able to do so in person. So a lot of these efforts that I just mentioned, we're going to be continuing those through the remainder of this process as we advertise the draft of the plan for the public to review and to comment on. And um, just to give you some ideas about the numbers that we're seeing on our website, it's one of the benefits of having the website is that it is able to give us a lot of information about how many people are coming to the site, how many people are engaging, uh, where those people live. We've been asking for zip codes uh, when people register with the website and when they take surveys uh, so that we know the parts of the city that we're struggling to reach, that we still need to try harder to reach, and then the parts of the cities that are really engaged with the process. So over 40,000 site visits since we launched in May 2020. We have uh, about 1,600 registered users right now. About 1,500 of those are active participants in the process. We've attended 24 of these in-person events uh, so far, and we will attend more. And in-person surveys that our engagement consultants have been able to do, they are probably somewhere near about a thousand paper surveys at this point. So we'll be continuing that effort as well. And like I mentioned, our public meetings are strategy sessions. We've done two for each of our topic areas, and uh, we've got a couple of more planned before we wrap up that particular section of public meetings. And I'm going to pass it back over to Bo. Thanks, Morgan. And Ed. Just quickly uh, to tag on to the public engagement uh, uh, list there, just last week, we did a telephone town hall through, with local uh, members of the AARP um, and uh, took questions and ideas from their, from their members. And we had 1,286 people on that one phone call. So um, we're just trying to, to demonstrate the kind, of, the kind of outreach we've been doing and then show you the, the different uh, uh, the touch points we've had throughout this process. And that's just one example from last week. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is the overall, this is a diagram that shows you our overall process. Um, I won't spend a ton of time here because I, I, feel, I feel like maybe we're getting a little long on time, but um, this, is, this is just a design to show you that we started out in a listening mode uh, taking all the issues and, 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 and people's values and inventorying those things. We spent about a year doing that. Uh, then in, in 20 and, and early 21, we kind of moved into more of a strategy phase where we, we developed our draft vision and goals uh, and now are in, in, in near the end of the process where we're working through our detailed recommendations with the public. So in terms of level of detail, you know, uh, in 2020, it was very broad and general and high level. And as we moved forward, of course, we got to a finer grain of detail and continue to do so as we move forward. Uh, on the public engagement side, early on, it was all about listening. Uh, it's still all, always about listening. Um, it's very open-ended conversations, uh, taking all ideas and inventorying those things. And then as we moved along the, the timeline, we moved into more of a strategic uh, kind of a, a, a an engagement emphasis, uh, thinking about action-oriented ideas and and, and getting into that public feedback loop. So we're, we're, we're uh, interested in, in pitching ideas and getting people's reactions to those things in, in this space as well. Uh, so the draft plan is what we're working on. We have begun working on that, uh, producing it. It will be a web-based thing. So we're building a website, we're drafting text, and we'll walk you through some of those chapters that we're writing uh, right now in just a moment. Uh, we don't have a clear timeline, you know, we're, uh, 
um, I'm not, we're not complaining, but we are losing staff and we, uh, we our, our ability to do things is somewhat uh, limited by, by who we have available to make maps and things like that. So we are, uh, we're working hard, but and we, as I said earlier, we hope to have a draft for you all to consider uh, later this year. Next slide. So this is a, a hierarchy of the plan, essentially of its structure. Um, you know, the, the, the top part of this pyramid is about the vision and the goals, which uh, talk about what we wanna be and how we can get there. And I'll, I'll show you our vision and our goal statements in a moment. Uh, then our objectives in that yellow kind of bottom half of the pyramid are more about actions and strategies. So uh, we, have, we have 10 goals. We have about 28 of these objectives identified. And this, these objectives, as you'll see in the next slide, is kind of where all those action-oriented strategies and, and all the recommendations live in those objectives. And then they kind of relate back to the goals and to the vision as well. And then, of course, we'll work on implementation and identifying metrics to know how, what the, how we know when we've succeeded. How do we measure success? Next slide. So this is uh, another diagram, kind of illustrating that that plan structure. Uh, we have the vision that kind of sits on top of what what we want to be, what we believe in. Um, we have our ten goals. We also will, will organize the plan around tr traditional, more conventional topics like land use and transportation and housing and neighborhoods, things like that. Uh, and then these objectives, this, this dark gray box at the bottom is, again, we have about 28 of those kind of topical objectives identified. And they, that's where all of our recommendations and strategies will live, will reside within those objectives. Next slide. So this is our vision statement. Um, it really comes from our public input from that first year I, I mentioned of listening to people and their ideas. It also comes from focus. The focus plan had a, uh, had a vision statement and we kind of blended those two things together and updated it to reflect some of the more important ideas that were coming out of our public engagement process like empowering uh, the community uh, and, think that, and being inclusive and equitable. You know, those ideas, even though the word equitable uh, give, give focus some credit appeared in the focus plan way back in 1997. So, uh, you know, yet another example of how it's sort of ahead of its time. Uh, next slide. I won't read all of these. This is just uh, a, a bunch of other statements that help to add detail to that kind of very broad vision statement. And again, the vision statement talks about what we want to be, how we envision our city to be in 20 years when all of these things have been done. So they're very descriptive. They're, they're describing a future uh, scenario. And, and so we're using these statements to kind of add detail to what that, that vision statement says. Next slide. These are our 10 goals. Um, and these will be uh, lar largely how the plan is organized around these 10 goals. And those objectives I mentioned earlier will relate back to these 10 goals. Uh, I won't read each one of these individually, but they deal with uh, targeting investments and eliminating disparities and, and, and mobility, community character, uh, and then smart city and technology issues, all, all those sorts of things. Uh, next slide. And then these, these 28 rather objectives Again, uh, I found, uh, I'm being repetitive here, but these are where all of our recommendations will live within these 28, I'll call them chapters, but they're just, they're sections within the plan. They kind of form the foundation of the plan and that they house all of those strategies and recommendations. And you can see the, the range of topics that are addressed uh, within each of those uh, objectives. Uh, so, so we're trying to, be, trying to be comprehensive to cover all the different topics within these 28 objectives. And we're currently drafting those now. Uh, next slide. So we've been working with our empowerment committee, which is kind of like a steering committee. Oh, we avoid using that word. Uh, it's really, they are helping us guide the overall direction of the plan. Uh, and their, their focus is, is, is providing that perspective and helping us to think about equity issues and how we empower neighborhoods and residents uh, and incorporating those values and lenses appropriately throughout the plan documents. So we've been working with them, their mayor appointed uh, committee. Um, 
uh, since 2021, and they helped us develop those those 10 goals. They helped us develop that draft that draft vision, uh, and they will continue to help us and have continued to help us uh, review the draft recommendations coming out of our strategy sessions and whatnot. Our strategy sessions are uh, again the, the, a series of public meetings around these four broad topics: mobility, serviceability, visibility, and livability. And I'll talk in a moment about what those entail, uh, but this, that's been kind of the, the organizing framework for our public engagement for about the past year. Uh, we started with mobility and uh, visibility, and we are now in serviceability and livability. We kind of did those two first in, in a phased approach, and we are close to wrapping up uh, this process and, uh, and creating a final draft set of recommendations related to, to each of these four uh, the strategy session processes. Next slide. Uh, so our strategy sessions, again, around these four topics, uh, visibility is kind of about all the things you can see in the built environment, the, the public spaces, the parks, um, uh, urban design and land use and those sorts of things. Uh, we've also embedded our preservation, historic preservation conversation within the visibility process. Uh, mobility, of course, is how we move around the city, how we move goods and freight around the city. Um, so it's, it's kind of all things transportation. Uh, our livability process is about uh, housing affordability, diversity, neighborhood livability, uh, neighborhood revitalization, community character, those sorts of things. And then serviceability is about our kind of our bigger uh, infrastructure systems and, and how we deliver services to promote growth. And thinking about that a little bit more from the citywide uh, system kind of approach. Uh, so, so we might talk about uh, it, neighborhood level infrastructure and livability, but we talk about kind of that broader, how we, how we guide development level of infrastructure and the serviceability. And we also are covering sustainability and uh, natural resources and things like that in our serviceability sessions as well. And again, we have uh, one more meeting each for serviceability and livability and those haven't been scheduled yet, but we'll, we'll uh, should have those scheduled soon and then uh, we can wrap up those two processes. Next slide. I think this is where I handed off to Morgan, is that right? Yes. Right. Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> so uh, I know there's a lot of text on these slides. Um, we will be happy to provide a PDF of this presentation to all of our commissioners so that they can review it. Um, and I know there's a lot of information. So I want to give you just a little bit of background on our strategy sessions, the topics covered there, and a lot of the feedback that we've been hearing so far. Um, mobility, it's probably the most straightforward one. It's transportation. It's how you're getting around the city, and it's how we can facilitate all modes of transportation um, for people of all abilities. A lot of the feedback that we've been hearing, obviously transportation is very important to uh, life living in Kansas City. Uh, a lot of people are, are asking for improvements to public transportation, making uh, the city more walkable, more bikeable. We also are hearing from a lot of people who are not huge fans of the bike lanes and they think that it's impeding traffic. So there are some, you know, conflicting viewpoints out there on a lot of these issues. Um, our job is to try and balance those as best as we can. Uh, They're asking for equity and in transportation investments across the city, especially in those parts of the city that may not have been invested in as much as others in the past. And they are also, you know, asking us to stick to our plans. We create a lot of plans at the city. They want to see us follow through and stick to the goals and the recommendations and strategies that come from them. For visibility, uh, this one focused a lot on urban design, architecture, historic preservation, parks, open spaces, all the things that you can visually see as you move about the city uh, that make this a place that you want to live, that, that creates that character, that, uh, that feeling of being a Kansas City and that people love that makes them want to stay here. And on here, um, we have heard a lot about having improved design standards, of course, Communities across the city, they vary greatly between each other on their character, uh, their typical style of architecture, and we need to be cognizant of that character and that context that those communities exist in when we are des creating design requirements that um, help to keep the character of the community instead of uh, gentrification or things like that happening that um, 
dilute that uh, in an existing community. A lot of uh, calls for in more historic preservation and restoring our historic buildings. Uh, changes have been requested to the process itself in how things get approved and how uh, sites are targeted. We also have heard a lot about um, retaining that fabric of an existing community. Uh, speaking back to that character of the community, that was something that we heard a lot about is people, they want to retain that. They want to retain that um, that idea of this is our community. It has this character and we want to stay here and we want the character to remain as well, uh, regardless of what kind of new development or redevelopment is coming into. And um, an interesting thing, you know, a lot of people in Kansas City, it's one of the largest uh, geographic cities square mile wise in the country, but a ton of people said, you know, it still has that small town feel, um, it still has that feel of connectedness and people um, being able to recognize each other in public, you know, seeing your neighbor, that kind of thing. Um, that was also a very strong thread in the feedback that we were hearing. So it's not just, you know, a huge major city. It's also a collection of smaller communities that are really important to the fabric of our city. Livability, um, primarily it's a lot about housing and neighborhoods. Um, the, uh, obviously one of the major topics that we've been hearing about a lot is affordability and the availability of having quality housing. Uh, not just that it's there, but that it is uh, energy efficient, that it is safe, uh, that type of thing. We've also been talking a lot in this uh, strategy session area about redevelopment, infill development, um, ADUs has come up a lot. Uh, these are things that we need to examine and implement some of these strategies to address our housing issues that we have. And it's also going to relate to the amenities that are available to these communities. Uh, the parks that are available, fountains, um, artwork, the things that really enforce that community character um, and makes that community somewhere where people want to live. And uh, lastly, I'll mention, you know, the gentrification and displacement issues are very significant. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about those issues and about possible ways to address those issues. And also for um, our elder population as they age, you know, allowing them to age in place so that they don't have to leave their community, they don't have to leave their city in order to be able to downsize or upsize on the housing that they're looking for, but they can remain where they are um, in perpetuity. So some of the feedback we've heard in our strategy sessions, um, obviously increasing the availability of affordable housing and making sure we're having a variety of housing types available. We're talking townhomes, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, uh, the colonnades, uh, apartment uh, complexes, all of those types need to be available at an affordable price for everybody. Uh, with a lot of promotion of the mixed use development uh, that enables people to uh, live in walkable communities where they can access their daily services on just a short walk or a short bike right away. We have heard a lot about complete streets, um, some people for, some people against, but um, there's generally a feeling of wanting to make sure that all mobility options through communities and that connect these communities, both physically and socially, that um, that is something that we prioritize and making sure that everyone can get around safely. Uh, improving the existing housing stock that's kind of related to our historic preservation part of this plan, um, but utilizing the housing that we have right now that may need improvements, um, you know, funding, things like that for their existing housing stock can is also an option to expand what we have available for people. And, uh, you know, the big city amenities, the things that make these Kansas City an exciting place to live. Uh, making sure that we are prioritizing those, um, properly locating them, making them available to everybody equitably, um, those types of things. And a lot of people, you know, they want to see more public engagement from the city when it comes to the issues that address their neighborhoods directly. They want to see more multimodal transportation systems, back to that complete streets issue. And they want us, a lot of people have asked us to examine the way that the city prioritizes investments. So where is the city investing its money? Is it the place that is just in need of it currently? Is it the place that needs it the most? Is it a place that has been historically neglected when it comes to funding or investment opportunities? Um, these considerations, a lot of people are asking us to um, embed that a lot more into the city's decision-making processes. 
And then serviceability, uh, we're talking about all the services that the city provides. We uh, particularly focus a lot of the conversation on infrastructure, streets, uh, sewer systems, water systems, all of those types of things, stormwater retention, um, preventing flooding, all of these services that the city provides. Um, we also talked a lot about targeting those investments, uh, making sure that when we are still growing as a city, which we will continue to do, that it's done in a responsible, uh, sustainable and equitable way. And also a lot of discussions about how the city can utilize smart city technology, uh, different things to make our service delivery, delivery more equitable, more efficient um, and more easy to navigate for consumers. A lot of feedback that we've heard on this one in our strategy sessions, a lot of talk about climate change and how that is going to have massive impacts on the cost of maintenance of our infrastructure systems. We um, need, you know, potholes did come up, <laughs> but we need to be able to make sure that we can maintain the infrastructure that we have and any investments in new infrastructure need to be closely examined um, for viability is a, a lot of the feedback we've heard on that one. Um, encouraging infill and redevelopment, a lot of people were in support of those types of land use decisions, um, supporting small businesses and startup businesses. We've heard a lot about that as well. And um, let's see here, thinking about people, communities, nature, and the interconnectedness between them. A lot of climate issues, a lot of environmental issues, a lot of open space issues, uh, people wanting to maintain what we have, improve the health of our ecosystems, and what the city can do in its own processes to uh, enforce that. And then uh, right now we've got a priority survey out there for these last two strategy session groups. Um, as you can see on here, that first question, what's most important for a de desirable neighborhood? This just kind of gives you an idea of some of the surveying that we've been done. Um, people want to see close proximity to daily needs. They want safety and security, uh, the barriers to affordable housing that we need to address, the poor quality and condition of the housing that's available, and that there's just not enough affordable housing. And on the last three questions, uh, prioritizing infrastructure in established areas, vast majority of respondents said it was very important to focus on that when it comes to considering costs and benefits of new development, um, making sure that it doesn't overstretch our city resources and hinder our ability to provide services. Vast majority of people said that that was very important consideration as well. And then when it came to our regional partners, planning for connected green spaces, um, natural habitats, reducing flooding, all of those environmental issues, um, also a majority of respondents felt that that was a very important issue for us to focus on as well. So I will let Bo go ahead and close us out. Thanks, Morgan. And just quickly, we're, uh, we're writing the draft, we're closing out our uh, serviceability and livability strategy sessions. We uh, we don't have a final meeting scheduled. We'll let you all know as soon as that is scheduled. Um, and we're beginning to draft the plan and, and create the, the website where it will live. So uh, so we're we are making good progress on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick plug for our photo contest. We've got uh, 30 or 40 pictures that have been submitted so far. We're asking people to just uh, provide their favorite photograph of, of Kansas City and, uh, and that we could use in the final publication. We'd appreciate that. So please go to playbook.kcmo.gov and, and there's a link there that'll take you to a place you can upload your photos. Next slide. And that's, uh, that's it. Here's our contact info, our website. You can see my name and email. And Morgan is at the bottom, and we'd be happy to take any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Bo and, and Morgan, for the presentation, and and my apologies from pushing it uh, from last last meeting to this one. So, uh, any any questions or thoughts uh, from the commission that you'd like to have, Commissioner? Uh, I've got I've got a question. Go ahead. In regards to participation, I think when we first started off there was little participation from first and second district. Have you got a sense of, are we getting equitable input across all districts or um, from the sessions I've sat into, there seems to be a lot of third and fourth, um, not a lot of sixth or first or second. So just trying to get a sense of, with the plan coming together now, have we got equitable input across the board from all, all districts? 
I can uh, try and address that one for you, Commissioner. We, when we started the process, uh, everything was done online through our website. So we did have access to that uh, zip code data about the people that we were really engaging with the process. When we brought on our public engagement consultants, we took that data, we analyzed it, we identified the areas of the city and the zip codes that we were struggling to reach the most. And we worked with our public engagement consultants to really focus on those areas, uh, making sure that we're attending as many events in those areas as possible, that we are drop doing literature drops at uh, locations that will let us do that kind of thing. So we have made pretty good big strides in trying to even out that, um, that spread of people who are engaged with the process across the city so that it's not so much focused in the fourth district. Um, we have seen increases in um, on the north side of the river, uh, down south of Kansas City and uh, east side neighborhoods. Those were the places that we were struggling to reach the most. And we have seen increased numbers there. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, but um, we're going to continue those efforts and we're gonna continue focusing on the areas that we're struggling to reach as we go through the remainder of this process. I just just to add to that that we we have a plan rollout when we have a draft plan ready we're going to roll it out with the big public engagement process and uh, so we will continue to emphasize those areas that have been uh, less in, engaged uh, um, th through the process and uh, as we roll out the plan and so we'll have a consultant uh, helping us with that um, but yeah we've seen increases in those areas uh, we're focusing you know, our efforts in those areas to try to, to try to boost our participation rates there. So we're really trying to consistently look around and see who's not at the table and then try to go find them and engage uh, with them. So. Um, and, and what are those areas now? I mean, you've reached out, are we still, what, what are the areas that you still think you we need input from? Yeah. So, uh, we think kind of the east side uh, of, of the city uh, and in our Northland and Southland and, and far east suburbs as well. So if you're in a, an outlying suburban area or the kind of east side of the urban core, we feel like those are the areas we've been targeting uh, to, to boost participation and awareness and engagement in those areas. And not, not to diminish in any way the great participation we've had from kind of that uh, west side of the, of the urban core, which has been tremendous. But, uh, and we, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, increases in those areas through through our, our public engagement consultant has been focusing on those areas for engagement for in-person events and things like that. And we have seen boosts in numbers, uh, you know, from people from those areas. Thank you. I mean, I think that's good. I, I, I think we need to get certainly, I know the fourth district is always pretty well representative, represented at the, at the reach out or the, the session. So um, I'd be interested just to see ultimately how we get first, second, third, fifth um, involved and sixth probably by the sounds of it. Mo, can I ask you a quick question uh, related to the means in which you're getting information out? I know one of the challenges is the different languages that we have in our communities. Has there been any data collected on the need to improve what the city does? Because I know they do keep that in mind when you're seeking data. Yes, so uh, I'm sorry, what was your question for seeing? Is it about uh, reaching people with language issues or? Yes, yes. Have you run into that need to have more than just English and Spanish uh, communications? How is that affecting us getting input? Have you, have you seen anything on that? Um, we, we have made uh, every effort to make things available. You know, like for instance, when we do, uh, when we, we record all of these meetings and we put them up on, on the web on YouTube for, uh, for future use and, and review. And those are always uh, translatable, you know, to any language. Okay. 
Right. So in our in our website is the same way. So uh, so yeah, we make every effort to to make sure materials are uh, are multilingual. Uh, so I'm thinking one of the things you might add is educating folks that they can translate your information online. Right. Some people don't know enough about your system to know that is out there. Right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. We've also uh, had some translation services through our public engagement consultants, and they've helped us to, uh, when they're doing literature jobs in a particular community where there is um, a predominant language outside of English, we've had um, some translations done to our uh, informational pamphlets and things that we've left um, at libraries and things like that. Uh, okay, thank you. I knew you're pretty good about doing that. I just thought I'd bring it up. So thank you. Thank you. We got a few questions. Um, congratulations so far on the engagement process. It sounds amazing. I'm wondering uh, how much of a comprehensive plan focuses on the what, which is, it sounds like so far, most of what the engagement is, is figuring out what that city looks like and how much of it might um, talk about how we get there. And just as examples, whether that's financing or changes to code, um, whether you're adding guardrails or removing roadblocks. Is that part of the comprehensive plan or is that separate from it? No, that's all part of it. Uh, so we spent a lot of time uh, about that first year just talking about people's ideas uh, and values and, and trying to inventory and measure those things and document all of that. And then we switched about a year in into a phase where we, we started to talk about the how. Uh, but we spent a full year just thinking about what we need to address in the comprehensive plan without really talking too much about uh, how we would fix those things or address them. But the, the part where we're talking about strategy, strategy sessions we're doing now are all about uh, identifying the how. And, uh, and so, yeah, when we write a, a set of recommendations to deal with a certain issue, we're thinking about all the things you mentioned, uh, funding, code changes, uh, what roadblocks are in the way, what partners do we need, uh, who's responsible for it, uh, what, what are some of the best practices that are happening, you know, all of those things. So we, our job as, as the professional planners here is to take uh, what the community told us they wanted and then figure out uh, from a professional planning point of view how to make that happen. And it involves all the things you said. We haven't gotten to the point where we're writing the implementation chapter yet or section yet, but that will identify um, all the details about how the how, you know, uh, as far as funding goes and partners and the metrics we use to measure success and all of those things. So, um, so yeah. Okay. And, and with that same lens, looking back at the 1997 focus plan, what are the things that we did best and what are the things that were kind of like left as academic, so to speak, that they work, but for some reason, there's just this weird barrier in Kansas City, whether it's our code, whether it's something else that it's like, we all want this, but we, we can't get there because there's something in the way. And, and the reason I ask it, what I'm trying to get at is, um, what are the levers that have the most impact when we talk about how, you know, is it the easiest way to get things done, although it's a smaller um, result, we can remove some small barriers and get a big result, or it takes a ton of energy to remove this roadblock and the result is, is relatively minimal. What are our best levers based upon what you've seen implemented from the 1997 plan? Well, we spent a lot of time looking at the focus plan and thinking about why or, and, and you know, we, we did a thorough analysis of it to see what had been implemented and what had not. And, uh, and so we have a pretty good idea of, of what, what things are still out there that need to be done from that plan. And, and, uh, and, and so, um, but there's a variety of reasons why something did or did not get done, you know, in that plan. Um, political reasons, um, funding reasons, uh, attention span issues. Uh, you know, there's there's all sorts there's all sorts of things that happen. Um, but we're we were we were uh, pleasantly surprised at the number of things that we can carry forward from the focus plan. Uh, some of the some of the I don't want to publicly criticize any of the, the focus plan because we we simply think it's a good a good plan. Uh, but we're trying to change some of the structure of this plan to make it a little more uh, user friendly, uh, to increase the likelihood that it will be used. Right. So. Um, 
So that's one thing. The other thing would be uh, to, to make sure that we're reflecting communities, the community's values in this document. And I think that the, 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 to the extent that we can demonstrate that uh, increases our ability to convince decision makers, people who make funding decisions and implementation decisions know uh, they can move forward with some confidence that the recommendations in the plan are based in community values and community uh, priorities and community input. So, um, and good good best practices in, in, in urban planning as well. So, uh, so that's kind of what we're trying to focus on in terms of making sure this is implementable. Um, pr providing clear direction on how to implement is critical to that too. So, uh, and identifying the low hanging fruit as you kind of alluded to, I think was is, is another piece of that identifying critical path issues. What do you need to do before you do the other thing to, to make sure it's, it's positioned to happen? So um, yeah, we'll try to address all of that. I don't know if I totally answered your question or not. No, that's, but... that's very helpful. Yeah, and one, uh, one Tyler, last, yeah. Just oh, yeah. I just wanted to also mention as far as uh, that implementation part of the plan, um, another thing that we are going to be doing is examining our area plan processes for the 18 area plans across the city. We're going to identify those common threads that we can upgrade into the conference of plans so that they apply to the entire city. And also just looking at how we do our area plan updates and how we can improve that, how we can improve the public engagement that we do and make it more robust uh, when we do update our area plans. And um, also part of the implementation, one thing that we're focusing on is trying to make our entire library of city plans a little bit more cohesive in how people can um, access them and review them and utilize them. So uh, we're, you know, in contact with all of our other department heads and our regional agencies as well with all of those plans that the city operates within. Um, another goal is to just make everything uh, work together and make that a lot more user friendly for people to be able to access that huge amount of information. And then one last one, and then I'll send the rest of my questions to you guys via email. Um, no knock on, on public engagement, but humans are, are humans, and I'm the most guilty of this. But sometimes we want things, or we say we want things, and then we have when we have them, we don't actually use them the way that we thought we would. And so throughout that process, is there a way of kind of trying to evaluate, you know, historically, as yes, people ask for this, but then... And I, I get too that sometimes, you know, um, you can't use something until there's enough robust infrastructure to make it useful. Uh, but how do you kind of discount people's wants versus what actually ends up getting used? Well, that's kind of the, the art of city planning, I think, is that, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we, we've got to, we have to take, and we get a tremendous amount of input uh, you know, mountains of, of input that we have to go through and summarize and analyze in the way you described uh, in other ways as well. So there's a lot of filters we have to apply and we, we have to try to do that without uh, losing important ideas too. So uh, it's, a it's a balancing act and it's delicate one, I think, but it's one that we're fairly adept at. We do a lot, I have been doing for some time. And it's just, it's just part of that process of, of converting public input and values into uh, feasible and, and actionable and implementable strategies and, and path forward is, is, a, is kind of just the simplest way to, to, to say how we do that. But yeah, that is something we have to factor in for sure. Makes sense. Thank you both so much. And I've got one more question with yep. regards um, to, sorry. Go, I was just going to say, kind of like to get it wrapped up here pretty quick. So yeah. go ahead and ask your question and uh, so we can move on to the regular agenda items. Yeah, no, I, thank we'll, you. we'll do. Thank, thank you. I just really, with the low-hanging fruit we've got on, on the implementation, are we feeding some of that already into the, into the council and so forth with regards to, I suppose, we've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with the infrastructure bill and I know the mayor's come out and certainly talked about uh, certain infrastructure, but just wondering whether we can leverage what is coming down from the infrastructure bill for the city to help with some of the, the longing for it on the financing side, I think. We, we have not conveyed the information in that way yet, but that's an interesting idea. I think 
certainly, it, particularly the, the, the strategies coming out of our serviceability strategy sessions would be useful in that conversation. So we certainly have a wealth of information about that topic that we could try to, to communicate to the city council or others who are making those decisions. And ultimately that's how the comprehensive plan should be used. I mean, once it's done, it should provide the guidance you're describing. Yeah, um, I'm, and, yeah. I suppose what I'm just saying is I don't know that we can wait until it's done yeah. because the money's coming and if we're not so pre-positioned for it, we don't sure. get it. No, I think, I think that's that's a good idea. We haven't had to explore that yet, but that's something we can, uh, we can give some thought to. Okay. Um, we certainly appreciate your time coming in and speaking to us. And again, apologize for the, uh, you know, delaying it to this meeting from last meeting. Uh, it's a wealth of information. I think there's a lot of great things going on. Uh, so we're pretty excited to see it come together. Uh, just one last thought. Is there anything the city planning commission can do to help you guys in your uh, quest to get this put together? Yes, very much so. Um, you guys can help us by spreading the word, um, letting people know that the website is up. It has tons of information, tons of ways to engage, and all of those options for engagement will remain open over the next six, seven months as we write this draft plan and put it out there for public review. So there's still tons of opportunities for people to get engaged and let us know what they want to see in Kansas City in the next two decades. Um, we just need to let people know that we're still going. We still want to hear from them. Uh, all friends, neighbors, anyone who works, lives, or uh, spends time in Kansas City, we need to hear from them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Joe, uh, I think everybody ready? Let's go ahead and move on to the next docket item. So I believe that's docket item number four. That's right. Docket item number four is case CPC 2021-00239. This is a request to approve a development plan to allow for the remodeling and expansion of a religious assembly facility and its accessory buildings and uses located in District DC-15 on about 1.6 acres on the west side of Broadway between 11th Street on the north and 12th Street on the south. Anna Nanaski is the staff planner. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm not Anna Nanoski, but I am presenting this case today. Um, this is Shrew Wood. This case in front of you is a development plan for the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. I believe everybody knows where this is. The reason you're seeing this today is because of the amount of square footage that exceeds 40,000 um, total square feet in this downtown district. Here's the location of the subject site. It's located in the downtown loop. More specifically, it's located on the west side of Broadway. Broadway is design, is a designed boulevard and there it's located in between West 11th Street to the north and West 12th Street to the south. It is currently zoned at DC-15, which stands for downtown core 15. The adjacent Zoning district and land use, including DR-1, which stands for Downtown Residential-1, that's located directly to its west. There is a zone district to UR and um, DC-15 to its north, south, and to its east on the other side of Broadway. The land use, including residential, a mixture of the businesses and offices uses as well. The site generally slopes down from the center to its west and to its east. And as you all know, Broadway Boulevard generally um, slopes down from 12th Street to 13th Street. And that's where the convention center is located on 13th and Broadway. Here are some street views. Um, this is a view looking north from West 12th Street and Broadway. The subject site is located on your left hand. As you can see, that's where the goat topped cathedral tower looks from this street perspective. And currently at the corner of Broadway and 12th Street, it is an open space. It is fenced open space. And it, all the fence and the buildings are made in red bricks. This is a view looking south from West 11th Street and Broadway. 
This is to the north of the site. And as you can see, currently there is a surface parking at this corner. And there are two buildings on the site. There is the west side, which has the, uh, the majority part of the church function and the goat topped uh, tower. There is another building located abutting Broadway Boulevard. And this building is used for office and rectory. There is a small building connected to the church um, on the south side as well. It's behind this street perspective, you cannot see it. So the applicant is proposing to demolish the east building, which is the building abutting the Broadway Boulevard and the small rectory next to the church and propose a new addition being added to the corner of 11th and Broadway. This is a rendering provided by the applicant. As you can see, uh, the building is largely made in veneer and stone cast. It is in the beige and earth tone, which distinguish the add-on from the historical building. As you all know, this historic church has been established since 19th century, and it is located in the Quality Hill neighborhood. It is listed on the National Registry for historic places. And the proposed new building does have um, a fritted glasses that's fronting Broadway in 11th. There is a proposed entryway from the 11th Street, which is from the connection between the new addition and the existing church. There is also another entryway from Broadway, which is located to the southeast corner of the building. And this is the perspective showing the new entryway from um, Broadway Boulevard. So the applicant has proposed a, a surface parking for the area that's currently used for that east building. The east building will be demolished and a surface parking of a total of 52 spaces will be provided. And the surface parking will be fenced and the fencing materials that they're using will comply with Boulevard and Parkway standards. However, I wanna highlight this site layout does not comply with our Parkway Boulevard standards. So the applicant has gone through a variance application and there are two variants granted regarding to this proposal. The first variance is regarding to the setback requirement of a surface parking on the boulevard. Our code requires a 30 feet setback for surface parking from the boulevard. The applicant proposed a setback of four foot, a four feet for this site. Uh, this variance was granted on um, March the 8th. The second variance is regarding to the amount of surface parking um, that's been contributed to the street frontage. Our code requires no more than 30% of the street frontage abutting Boulevard can be used for surface parking. The applicant proposes a amount of uh, night amount of 65% of the street frontage to be used to fill the surface parking. So from staff perspective, we do not encourage this site layout. We have communicated our perspective to the applicant that we would prefer the new proposed building to um, provide a longer facade abutting Broadway and more activities for pedestrians along Broadway. However, the applicant has demonstrated there are practical difficulties due to the topography of the site and there is a need for the surface parking due to their clients. Um, so here are some utility plans on, on the other side for, from the site plan. The applicant has proposed to keep the existing two-story church, which is the West Building. That building has um, two stories and have a total of 21,000 square feet. The applicant also proposed the addition, as I mentioned earlier, to the northeast corner of the site. And the new addition will be functioning um, to serve the church as a uh, supplement area, which will have two stories and a total of 19,000 square feet. The applicant also proposed a new rectory area, which will be located uh, within this addition. And the proposed new rectory will be roughly 10,000 square feet. So due to the topography change, there are two to three stories um, throughout the site. And the surface parking, of course, is located abutting the corner of the 
West 12th and Broadway. The building will, the site will have a total of 50,000 square feet building area. Um, and the site is only about 70,000 square feet. So it does have a total FAR, which stands for um, floor air ratio of about 0 0.7. Just keep, kind of give you an idea about the density for this site. So on the other side, staff did make sure the applicant is aware on this site, we do not have a parking requirement because it is on DC, which stands for downtown core. For downtown core, we don't require parking spaces. However, there is a need um, presented by the applicant that the 52 parking spaces is a must for their future growth and to maintain their existing needs. So there are existing utilities and there are existing street trees around the site. The applicant proposed to um, keep the existing trees along Broadway 11th and 12th and adding a total of um, 14 street trees to the site and 85 shrubs and bushes, mostly focusing along Broadway. And this is also a result of working a, co or a collaborative work between staff and the applicant because there is a surface parking being proposed. So staff highly recommended the applicant to add it a uh, soft screening and streetscape to the um, Broadway and the corner of the 12th and Broadway. And a future streetscape plan is required by staff uh, for detailed reviewing regarding to the signage, the fencing, the sidewalk, and any aesthetic purpose and perspectives along Broadway. These are some elevations provided by the applicant. This is another way demonstrating the building articulations. Uh, as you can see, it is a beige earth tone and it does have uh, glasses and meets the Parkway Boulevard standards that 60% of the facade shall be transparent for that area abutting the Broadway Boulevard. And these are some elevations showing um, the south and the um, north parts. This is an outdoor lighting plan provided by the applicant to light up the surface parking area. It generally complies with the code requirement. So these are the variances, as I mentioned, have been granted by the Board of Zoning of Adjustment on March 3rd regarding to the requirement for parkway and boulevard standards. And because this use is permitted by right, and because the variance has been granted by the Board of Zoning of Adjustment, and the applicant is willing to adding extra landscaping and uh, submitting future streetscape plans for details for staff reviewing. Staff generally supports this proposal. So we do recommend approval with conditions as attached to the staff report. And I do wanna highlight that the applicant did conduct the public engagement process and they hosted a public meeting on February 7th, 2022. Um, this complies with the code requirement and staff has re received a neighborhood association opposition letter from the DNA, which is the Downtown Neighborhood Association. Uh, we received this on Monday afternoon and there was no way we can attach it to the staff report on time. So I believe we had our administrative assistant um, forwarded this to you, but I also attached it to this PowerPoint. If you would like me to present it, I can read it out loud. It's a little long, it's about four pages and there are graphics and a lot of words as well. So that generally concludes my presentation and I do have a presentation from the applicant as well. So I will just be waiting for your instruction and questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, from the commission standpoint, I had a chance to read the uh, opposition letters. Everybody else had that opportunity as well. Okay, um, so there's really no need to, to read that issue. Um, any questions from the commission to the city staff? Okay. All right, uh, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant then. So if the applicant's available, uh, uh, please join us by stating your name and address for the record. Good morning, this is Lindsay Tatro with SFS Architecture. Address is 2100 Central Street, Suite 30, Kansas City, Missouri, 64108. 
Um, I'm Martha Kaufman. I'm the construction manager for the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph. Um, address 20 West 9th Street, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, welcome, both of you. Um, I guess, tell us about the project, if you don't mind. And I believe there was also a Father Paul Turner. Was uh, Has he been allowed to participate yet, or do you see him online? I'll let Joe answer that question. Here I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Let me get my video on. Here we are. Uh, I'm Father Paul Turner, proud citizen of Kansas City and pastor of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. Thank you, commission members, for your service to Kansas City and this opportunity to speak to you. The Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception is planning improvements to the property on the east side of our historic landmark. We already welcome friends and visitors for worship and service. Each week, we draw many hundreds of people from the city, the suburbs, and around the world to our corner, many of whom then enjoy other aspects of downtown Kansas City. Our parking is limited. It is the single greatest complaint we hear from members and visitors alike. We are grateful to the Board of Zoning Adjustment for granting variances to alleviate this concern. We plan to raise construction of less historic value than the cathedral, shift parking to the south of our property, and erect a new building at the corner of 11th and Broadway that will connect to the cathedral. That building will house our offices and a new Donnelly Hall suitable for social and cultural engagements. The slope on 11th Street makes the location for that new building critical to provide better handicap accessibility through an interior elevator into the cathedral and a bridge to much needed restrooms, a hall for events that pertain to our worship and the offices. It will also open a better sight line for pedestrians to see our historic building, which is directly accessible on 11th Street. By contrast, moving the new building to a longer footprint alongside Broadway would eliminate the connection, causing a practical difficulty, especially uh, for those who are physically challenged, but also for others seeking ease of access to both locations. We, we believe our proposal will make the cathedral an even more vibrant part of Kansas City. Thank you. Shu, if you would go to the next slide, uh, supplementing the information she provided, uh, we have, Shu, would you be able to advance to the next slide? Uh, so what you see here is an existing diagram that shows the current configuration of the property. Um, you can see in blue the existing amount of paved area. That paved area extends all the way up to the face of all of the existing buildings uh, with little landscaping being provided in the current configuration. Uh, you'll see the school building adjacent to Broadway. That is the structure uh, that Father Paul is referencing that would be raised as part of this proposal, um, as well as there are currently 42 parking spaces on site. Shu, if you could go to the next slide, please. This is a diagram showing our proposed configuration for the project. Uh, as mentioned, the new addition for the new parish center would be oriented towards the north end of the site. Um, you can see that we are actually reducing the paved vehicular use area in this new proposal, uh, but adding an additional 10 parking stalls. We feel that this proposal will provide better pedestrian access around the site. Currently, there are no internal sidewalks on property, uh, but with this new proposal, you will be able to circulate around the property um, outside of the vehicular use areas. If you could go to the next, thank you. This is a visual of the landscape that we are proposing 
as Shu mentioned, uh, there would be a landscaping buffer around the perimeter of the parking lot um, with a, a proposed uh, area towards the southeast corner at 12th and Broadway. We'll have a graphic of that uh, public art component here a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but then concentrated in the center of the parking would be a landscaped island uh, with trees. Go to the next. Now, this is a view that you saw previously in Shu's presentation as well, but a, a view of the existing condition at 11th and Broadway, the northeast corner of our site. If you could go to the next image, shows a proposed rendering. Uh, we feel that the new parish center addition reinforces the urban condition at the corner of 11th and Broadway. Additionally, it eliminates two current vehicular access points on site, one off of 11th Street and one off of Broadway. Um, the new addition is intentionally kept low and simple so as to not detract or compete with the historic cathedral. And as you mentioned, the beige tone uh, cast stone cladding material that we are proposing for this addition uh, is intended to be an extension of the, lands, the, the limestone foundation uh, at the bottom of the historic cathedral, rather than trying to mimic the historic structure's red brick. Additionally, uh, if you go back one, one second to that image, I did want to point out as well that the, uh, the parish hall gathering space uh, is on the second story of this building, and it overlooks both 11th Street and Broadway uh, through expanses of glazing. If you could go on to the next. Uh, this is a high images highlighting the proposed entrance, uh, which is south situated at the southeast corner of the Parish Hall addition uh, adjacent to Broadway Boulevard. Uh, we have placed the entrance uh, off of Broadway mid block to better accommodate all modes of transportation, uh, be that vehicular, pedestrian, or transit. Uh, the proposed entrance um, will provide, as Father Paul mentioned, a much improved accessibility to both this new facility as well as the existing cathedral itself. Um, we've increased the glazing and transparency at this entrance point, as well as ex extending that glazing along Broadway Boulevard. You can go to the next. This is an image of the southeast corner of the site existing conditions at 12th and Broadway. If you could go to the next, our proposed view, uh, as you can see, does increase the sight lines to the historic cathedral and the stained glass uh, with the existing school building gone and our new proposed addition being pushed to the northern edge of the site. Uh, the vehicular access will be consolidated to a single point off of 12th Street. Uh, and you can see the highlighted new public art element at the corner of 12th and Broadway. This concludes our design presentation, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the commission regarding uh, this project? I have one she brought up with only one entry point into the parking. You said off of 12th. Is 12th a one-way street on that side of Broadway? Is it, it is a not. Way? It is, is a two-way two way? street, correct. Okay. And then just south of this, is that where the surface parking lot is that's across from Bartle? Is correct. So I'm confusing the structure then that's south of that parking lot. That's not tied to the church at all, that's right there by the freeway? Um, I may not understand the structure you're speaking of. I was thinking there was a church that is also right across from the South Bardo, right uh, next to I-70. You may be thinking of Grace and Holy Trinity Cathedral. That's the Episcopalian Cathedral, good neighbors of ours. That surface parking lot separates the, the two cathedrals. 
Okay. I had you in that location and y'all kept throwing me when you kept saying 11th. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. So thank you for letting me know that there's two because I had only identified one. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Can, uh, can you just confirm? So you will have access to the facility on, on Broadway. You'll be able to go in the door there as well Correct. as 11th street. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, if there's no more questions from the commission, uh, so at this time, I'll go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. If there's anybody that would like to speak uh, regarding docket item number three, or sorry, docket item number four, uh, please raise your hand and you'll be called upon. Joe, is there anybody that raised their hand? Mr. Chair, I will promote Josh Bunn and Edward Blasco. Okay. They have raised their hand. Give me one moment. I have just promoted them. Uh, hi, Josh. If you don't mind stating your name and address for the record. Sure. My name is Joshua Baim. I live at 523 Grand Boulevard, Kansas City, Missouri, 64106. Yes, sir. So um, uh, I am the board chair of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. We've been tracking this case with a lot of interest. Um, we're very supportive of our neighbors um, at, at the um, Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. We generally support their, their program and the ministry that they provide to our residents. Um, so checkbox, 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 lots of great things happening there. Um, Want to just reiterate our support there. The thing that, that, that we're really struggling with here is the site plan um, that, that has been presented. And, and we've kind of been tracking some of the changing narrative as, as the case has gone on. Um, but I wanted to start really by, by um, recalling a couple of things that I heard during the previous presentation, a couple of questions from commissioners about how plans, long range plans get implemented. And I think the great news is that planning commissioners have the ability to implement plans. <laughs> you, you'll have, if you all mentioned that you saw our letter, so you noticed that we had a rubric that compared the several different area plans, the bike plan, the TOD plan, I, I helped to write the TOD plan. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, that our justification for opposing these plan, opposing this proposal is really based in those plans. Um, it's not, you know, anything arbitrary or anything that you haven't heard before. The site plan that you have today would 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 be great in a place like Overland Park. It'd be great in a place with parts in in in, in parts of the Northland or or South KC. Uh, we we don't think it's bad architecture or bad site design in general. It's just not appropriate for downtown. Um, and so we're really hoping that you all, as the plan commission, can recommend to the city council either approval with a different set of conditions that are a change to the current site plan or uh, recommend to the city council that they deny the development plan. Uh, really, it comes down to um, the, the active facade or lack thereof on Broadway. Broadway is a signature street. It's a boulevard. Uh, it is a, um, you know, an, an image street. Um, it's a street that we really care about. Um, it doesn't today exist like we want it to exist. We would love to see more built things along Broadway. We'd like to create that street wall to promote walkability. Um, and we think that the church could do this with minimal financial hardship. We think that it's reasonable to expect that they could do that. So our, you know, um, you know, in, in, in our dream, they would work with us as a partner to move that, you know, uh, uh, the volume of that building um, along along Broadway, so it could better activate that urban area. The the surface parking lot that um, uh, was previously mentioned is actually owned by the city. There's a, it, the, there's a redevelopment process there, so we're excited to see that redevelop. Um, all around the site, both off street and on street, there's an abundant amount of parking. The great thing about downtown is you've got uses that you can balance out throughout the day. And so as a result of that, we, we really wanna balance parking and share parking among different users. Not every individual parcel or lot can hoard parking downtown. If we did that, we wouldn't have a downtown to speak of. And that's, that's really the biggest concern that we have here is that we see that kind of behavior here. 
Um, and so um, we appreciate all the concerns that that the, the, the applicant has brought up. We um, you know value them as a community member. Um, but we think there are reasonable ways that you could improve the site plan and comply um, here. Now, I, I'll say that the Board of Zoning Adjustment decided to grant variances. We think, I think personally that that was the ref making a bad call there. You all as plan commissioners, really the city council still have your legislative discretion to approve or deny a development plan. Um, and, and we think that you should hold <laughs> the applicant here to the Boulevard standards. Um, and we think that a shared parking arrangement would be much, much preferable um, and, and would serve the community, would get um, um, parishioners and visitors out into the community more. We think that would be uh, a tremendous opportunity. Um, in terms of maintaining a connection to the uh, to the historic structure to the Gold Dome Cathedral, I think, you know, um, I, I'm not an architect. I'm just a lowly urban planner here. Um, but I think you know, with a little bit more study, you could probably take that big volume of building where the event space or the, the big community space is going to be. I think you could put that volume and kind of create an L shape. We, we mentioned this in our letter, create an L shape on Broadway. You'd have the same volume of building on the site, same square footage. Uh, you'd lose some parking spaces. That would be the consequence of that. But then you would still create that active street wall, that active street edge, uh, and can maintain that, that, um, that axis with the building, that connection. Um, now, again, I'm not, I'm not an architect. And I, I should speak for the applicant there, but I think with a little bit more study and with partnership with the DNA, the applicant could do that. So um, that, that's really our, our hope and dream for the site. Um, obviously, there are some other minor improvements as well. Uh, in, our, in our original presentation back in February that we uh, sat through um, there, you know, we saw an entrance right at the corner on 11th and Broadway. Um, that's been moved kind of, it's, it's still near Broadway, but it's really oriented toward the parking lot. So, you know, another entrance there would be, you know, if, if there were kind of a compromise position, that would be kind of a nice thing to have uh, to really activate that urban edge. Um, so think things like that could change as well, but really the core conflict here is how do you activate Broadway? How do you um, create a more urban site plan here. There were other things we mentioned in our letter too about, you know, the, the main entrance being toward the surface parking lot. You know, if, if the, the church were to redevelop that surface parking lot in the future, uh, you know, having the main entrance there would be, it, it'd be a little bit difficult um, you know, you'd have to, you'd probably want to move the entrance to a different location. And so yet another reason why you would want to orient um, the entrance to uh, another street. So um, a lot of concerns generally with the site plan, um, supportive of the use, but wanted to, to state our case and, and really encourage you as plan commissioners to, um, um, you know, consider the downtown context, consider the area plans here, consider all of the community feedback that has gone into creating those plans and then act accordingly. So thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shu, who was next? I believe I have promoted. Um, give me one second. Mm. Shu, I think it was Edward Blasco. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who's on the right. screen. Hi, Edward. If you don't mind stating your name and address for the record, please. My name is Edward Blasco. My residence is 9741 Sunset Circle in Lenexa, Kansas. I am chairperson of the building committee for the cathedral. And I want to just let the commission know that we have been studying this since 2019. And we have looked at many different orientations on the property and the disparity between the level street level of Broadway and the exit from our church is a, is one floor and I don't know how you would possibly uh, make it work uh, doing it any other way. We're very proud of the design that we have come up with and I would encourage the commissioners to consider the beauty that will be added to this corner uh, both the new structure and the visibility of the existing cathedral with the beautiful stained glass and the gold dome. There will also be beautiful landscaping as well so that your eyes are drawn up towards the gold dome and the beautiful stained glass. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, Shu, that would like to speak regarding docket item number four? I have seen none. Nope. 
No one else raised their hands. Okay, at this time, we'll go ahead and uh, close all public testimony then, uh, and then come back to the applicant. So it seems like there's maybe some concern or some thought there, just kind of like to hear you address. Um, I'm assuming that you've seen the letter from uh, the Downtown Neighborhood Association and uh, maybe for, provide some comment on that. Sure, we, we did uh, receive the letter late yesterday and had reviewed it. And the, the imagery that is provided in the letter is a, a much earlier rendition of the design. Uh, we do feel that you know, we have pushed that entrance over to the Broadway side such that it is off the southeast corner um, of the new addition to the parish center um, to hopefully better activate Broadway, uh, additionally providing more glazing uh, along that street front, front to activate that corridor, as well as you know one of uh, one of the goals of this project is to provide better accessibility and ADA access to the historic cathedral. Uh, which is accomplished through this building linking into the existing cathedral. Um, we have explored many site plan options, as Ed has mentioned, um, in reviewing uh, feedback from the, from the Neighborhood Association as well from our meeting. Um, so we do feel like uh, there are, are some aspects that we have uh, been able to address, uh, but uh, understand their um, position on the parking. And uh, I don't know, Father Paul, if you would like to speak a little bit to that need. Sure, I'd be glad to. We, we have uh, four primary church services every weekend that before the pandemic drew 200 people per service, and we are approaching that number again, uh, even in these, these last few weeks. So the, uh, the, the use of the parking is kind of specialized for cert certain events that we have here. And uh, it does provide uh, a source of welcome for, for people. So the, the idea of, of the lot is, is pretty, pretty critical to us being able to complete our mission. Uh, I've also mentioned that we, we're a site that draws people from all over. We, we notice, especially when conventions are happening downtown, People are able to walk up and enjoy the the, the amenities of, of the cathedral, so we're we're grateful, uh, very grateful to our neighbors in the in the DNA for uh, thinking about uh, how to keep this uh, project a, a beautiful one and one that is friendly to everybody who lives and, and works downtown. Is the parking always going to be uh, private or? Will there be a shared component at some point or not? The, there are a lot of people who think this parking lot is public and, uh, and they use it. Um, we, uh, it, it, is, it is our, our private lot. We, we have not really tried to charge people for parking here. We're trying to make it uh, amenable for our uses, but I don't anticipate that we would be using the lot as a place for others to park while doing things not connected to the to the cathedral. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, last questions from the commission? I have a couple. Um, back to the new lot, how many spaces for some reason 50 is coming to my memory? Is that what we said? The, 52, the new lot? 52. 52 compared to 42 existing. And Father had mentioned the ability for the um, entrance for the ADA compliance would be from the second floor of this new building. Did I hear that correctly as well? Not, not exactly. The, the, uh, for ADA, people would park in the lot, enter the, the, the ground floor of the new building, and there they would find an elevator that would take them to the floor level of the cathedral. Okay, so, that's what I was referring to. Yeah. So does that also mean then that you would have dedicated spaces? Correct. So would the entire 52 be disabled or handicap accessible designations? No, we, we have established the quantity of accessible parking spaces 
based on the city requirements of total parking spaces provided within the area within the parking lot. And so that current requirement requires three accessible spaces. So that is the quantity of accessible parking stalls, dedicated accessible parking stalls that would be within the new lot. So Father had mentioned that you have an attendance of approximately 200 per session that they have services. So that means overflow goes to the surface lot to the south of you? Everybody's on their own for overflow. So some people may park there. Most everybody wants free parking when they come downtown. So they look for places on the street or any, anywhere else they can go. We have recently been working out a deal with one of the neighborhood lots to assist us with overflow. They were extremely helpful for an extremely large diocesan celebration we had two weeks ago that drew 700 people to the cathedral. So we, we have been trying to uh, utilize some of the additional parking when, when it becomes available to us. So I guess the next question I have is for staff. Is that parking lot to the south, is that a city-owned lot? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Barely, yeah. Oh, hold on. I think I have a little hard time with this technology here. Uh, is your question about the surface parking at 12th and Broadway that's existing across the street from 12th? It is city owned at this moment. So have we sought some type of partnership with the city for parking, Father? We have not achieved that directly with that particular lot. We have tried, we, we have arranged uh, in the past, we certainly did do some outreach to them. We're looking for some kind of more permanent assistance to us because even with the, with the additional parking that the BZA approved for us, that still does not satisfy our needs for many of the events that take place in this building. So this new lot, if I remember the display, is moving from the corner of 12th Street now to the corner of... Uh, it, it's the flip from 11th to 12th. Okay. <laughs> I'm still trying to pull you in the other location I was stuck <laughs> on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that that that's just the flip of, of that parking. Okay. I think I'm I'm good for now. Thank you, Kobe. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the commission? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just got a clarification. Did I sure. hear from the applicant that the downtown neighborhood was working off older plans or comments were from older plans? The, the imagery shown in the letter that they presented is a previous design that did have the entrance um, pushed further to the west uh, to be uh, more central to the facade, the southern elevation of the building. Um, we have since uh, shifted that entrance to be directly adjacent to Broadway Boulevard as well as um, increase the amount of glazing on that eastern elevation. And is that all the, in, are there any other uh, areas of concern that the new plans would address? Uh, well, the, the, these were the plans that they saw at the neighborhood meeting. The imagery that they're referencing in their letter um, was from some, publication of the design uh, from the master plan early on. And so they're making reference to those imagery in their letter, but the, the design that was presented in the neighborhood meeting more closely resembles what you are seeing here today. Okay, but I suppose my question is, has the Downtown Neighborhood Association seen your latest plans? And, and Yes, okay. they have. And I'm unclear then whether their comments are reflecting the later plans or the older plans. That's all. Yep. Well, I, I think the the most important one is the is the one that Lindsay mentioned with regard to that 
entry point that has moved toward Broadway. I think uh, some of their other concerns were, were addressed by the BZA last week, but, uh, but that particular one, we, we could, as, as we've testified today, has been updated and we think makes it much more pedestrian friendly on Broadway. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the commission? So with that, we're gonna go ahead and close all testimony and speak amongst the commission. And if there's nothing to discuss, I will take a motion. Anybody like to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll add my thoughts. Um, excuse um, me, before you take a motion, can I request that you move, re move condition number 15? That is the condition regarding to the public engagement process. And I have received their public engagement summary um, after the staff report was prepared. If you could remove this condition, it would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I won't make a motion yet, but um, I just wanna say that, yeah, I, I really appreciate the Downtown Neighborhood Association giving us this information. Um, that said, I think it's a really smart, beautiful plan. I don't know how you could create good ADA access to the entry of the cathedral without putting the building where it is. Um, fully understand, you know, that in an ideal world, parking isn't isn't put at this corner. But having been to this cathedral for volunteering for weddings, you do park really really far away. And for some people, that's not a problem. But I understand that, you know, for um, others, you want to have really accessible parking. I think it's going to be a really smart redesign. And um, I appreciate the way that the applicant and architects and developers have, have approached this because I do think it's a challenging um, topography just based upon having the entrance at the highest part, but having everyone access it at a lower part. And so again, you know, it's, it's tough because I, I understand what the Downtown Neighborhood Association is pointing out in terms of um, the goals that we have with all these different plans, but I think it's our commission's responsibility to, to read the nuance between them and understand that each site is different. And so that's why um, I'll be supporting the plan as it is. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to comment? Orstein? I'd like to confirm you're uh, kind of breaking up on us there. Another point. I know that if that the thing, hear me? No. I uh, you're breaking up pretty bad. Not better. Pretty no. bad still. You might want to try turning off your camera sometime. Okay, I've got an update coming. Okay. It's not in place. Still can't hear you, Forstein. Maybe, hopefully, didn't lose you. My system shut down and popped back up. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that with their historic designation, they had mentioned this does not affect the new building, does not affect that, correct? Um, Ms. Bisley, if your question is whether or not the historic preservation committee needs to weigh in, the answer is no, because it's not listed on the Kansas City Historic Places. It is on the list of national registry. Is that your question? <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Uh I mean, comments, and, and frankly, my comments are everything that uh, Commissioner Enders had talked about. Uh, I, I agree with that, and, and I'm supportive of the project as well. Um, can I get a motion, please? 
Sure. Chair Crowell, I move to approve docket item number four um, with conditions, but removing condition number 15. Second. I've got a motion and a second for approval of docket item number four with the removal of condition 15. Lisa, can you take roll call on that motion, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crowell? Aye. Enders? Aye. And Hill? Aye. Okay, looks like the motion passes five to none. We certainly appreciate you bringing it in and good luck as you move forward on this project. I know it's been a long time coming. So thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much for your support. Really appreciate it. Come visit us sometime. Yep. Okay, Joel, let's move on to docket item number five, please. All right. <clears throat> docket item five is case number ROW 2021-00008, request to vacate several streets and alleys in District R1.5, located south of 22nd between Olive on the west and Prospect on the east to allow for residential development. Najma Muhammad is the staff planner. Good morning. Before us, we have docket item number five, CD ROW 2021-0008 for an alley and street vacation. Sorry, my computer is moving without me. This is the location of the subject site. This is the um, uh, aerial view of the location focusing on the southern portion of this rectangle. This is a closer view of the location with the red lines indicating the areas that will be vacated. Again, this is showing the areas that will be vacated on a aerial site map. Another aerial view, a little bit closer, giving more of an idea of how wide and long these vacations will be in relation to the site. And an overview of the approved development plan that supports this vacation. Staff recommends approval with conditions as stated here, although from the staff report condition number three will be um, changed to reflect the updated condition um, by charter as of this morning to vacate and release easement rights in the alley between Olive and Wabash, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You all can read that, but that will replace the um, previous condition. The developer shall reimburse charter for the relocation of a mainland plant. They were able to remove that condition and receive another one from Charter. That concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the commission uh, to city staff? Can you repeat that last thing you said, Ms. Muhammad? Yes, ma'am. Last week, the applicant developer requested a continuance to work with charter to change their condition and they were able to change their condition as of this morning to reflect um, a new condition from charter outside of the one that was listed in the staff report initially is that what you're i was referring? trying to read this i was trying to read it as you had up and i thought it said something about a water main and i was going to ask the commission whatever happened to the case that came before us where we had issues with who was going to do something with the water. Did that come before us and I wasn't here? Yeah, I think that was an issue before on this actual project itself, and I'm not sure the final resolution of, of that. If Olaf was on the line, he may be able to speak to this as he's handling the other um, aspects of this case. Yes, I am. 
Sorry, I was not, I did not hear the question. Can you repeat the question? This yeah, project came before us before and it was dealing with a water main condition. And I thought it's kind of in the same area that we're now talking about the alley vacations. And I'm like, did we miss what the result was on the water main? Cause I don't recall it coming back before us. And the water main issue was resolved prior to us going to uh, city council for approval of the UR development plan. So that's, that can move forward now. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Olufu. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Okay, so seeing none, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant. So if the applicant is available for docket item number five. working on promoting them. How are y'all doing? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. This is Tim McKinney with Telephone Brown. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Muhammad, for your presentation. Uh, as she stated before, we're requesting uh, approval with the uh, conditions stated. Um, we did, like she said before, we did uh, get the, um, the document revised from Charter uh, as of this morning. Um, so if you all have any questions for me, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, any questions for the applicant? All right. So at this time, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. If there's anybody out there that would like to speak uh, regarding docket item number five, please raise your hand and you will be called upon. It does not appear that anyone has raised their hand. There's been, I, I think, Zoom is maybe malfunctioning a bit because it shows that two hands have been raised for some time since we had testimony on the cathedral case, but I'm not seeing anyone in the list who actually has their hand raised. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go ahead and close public testimony then. And uh, any other items to consider, Mr. McKinney? Uh, no, that's it for at this time. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So at this time, we'll go ahead and close public testimony. If there's anything we can discuss, we shall. If not, I'll take a motion, please. Chair Crowell, I move to approve docket item number five, um, amending and changing condition number three to update it per the staff presentation. Second. Okay, so I've got a motion and a second for approval of docket item number five with the, and amending condition number three. Lisa, can you take roll call on that motion, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Corral? Aye. Enders? Aye. And Hill? Aye. All right, looks like the motion passes five to none. We appreciate you bringing it in and good luck as you move forward. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, so Joe, let's move on to docket item number seven, please. Docket item seven is case number CPC 2022-0010. Request to approve a development in district R0.5 to allow for a four-story medical office building on about five acres located at the northeast corner of 9th and Euclid for the pediatric wing for the Samuel U. Rogers Health Center. Olufu Agbaji is the staff planner. Thank you, Joe. Can Good I interrupt morning, before you get started, Olufu? I need to recuse myself on this one, Chairman Crow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that means we have uh, four for this uh, particular case. Commissioner Enders, Allender, Hill, and myself. Go ahead, Old Fu. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, members of the CPC. 
Well, for graduate city planning and development staff. This next case is a request for a development plan uh, to allow for the pediatric wing addition of the Samuel U. Rogers Health Campus. Again, if you can promote uh, Brenton Cells with Telefera and Brown. And the site is just located uh, the lower, the east side, just east of downtown, specifically at uh, just between 8th Street and 9th Street between Euclid and, uh, and Brooklyn. So this is the site. <clears throat> if you recall, uh, back in 2021, we approved a UR development plan that split this into two that allowed for 64 unit apartment for some for Brimshaw development. Again, this is the Samuel U. Roger campus, which sits just between 6th, uh, 7th Street and 8th Street. Um, these are pictures of the site as it sits now. So as you can see, the site has a bi-level whereby uh, the site on Euclid is higher and the site on uh, Brooklyn is lower. So <clears throat> another picture looking at the site from Brooklyn with the main entry to the existing building. Uh, it's about five acres currently zoned R0.5. And um, again, that approval as part of this uh, campus was back, done back in August of last year. The existing office building will remain. It's before you today for an addition to our multi-level, which is actually four-story building addition that will include two-story garage on the lower level and uh, two-story offices. The overall building will then come to about 33,000 square feet and the parking for the overall uh, campus would be 382. The access again to both the existing garage and the existing parking will be on a split level with the lower level having access of 8th Street and then the upper level having access of, uh, of Euclid. <laughs> and this is the site in question. And this is a, a site plan with the existing building showing the proposed expansion. So all this configuration will remain. Um, one of the major, um, the use is okay with staff and we all agree uh, with the proposed use and the layout. The main issue we had was the proposed garage and the addition and how we're going to screen the garage both architecturally and landscape using landscaping to make sure that the headlights on the on the lower level garage and the headlights on the upper second floor of the garage are properly screened from the existing residences along Brooklyn. And they did submit that revised, uh, revised building or revised architecture. <laughs> Here's a 3D rendering of what it will look like. So they will go ahead and make sure that the garage is properly screened. And then the offices on the upper level will then be above the two levels of garage. Again, here's another elevation provided by the applicant. Staff's recommendation is to approve our subject to the 23 conditions. And again, as I stated, we'll continue to work with the applicants to make sure that this uh, vehicle in the garage and the garage itself is screened architecturally and with landscaping, which staff will review both prior to ordinance request and also with the building permit. That ends my presentation and I'll take any questions. Hey, thank you, Olafu. Any questions from the commission regarding docket item number seven? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant uh, with us. Thank you. Good morning. Hi there. Good morning. I should have Aaron Cerna from HJM and uh, Bob Dice from the hospital as well. Okay. My name is Brent Sells. Who's, from... who's this? Sorry, Brent, who's the second one? I think Zoom's not showing me raised hands anymore. Sorry. Uh, Robert Dice, T H E I S. Or Bob. Okay. We told him this was optional, so he might not be on. Yeah, I don't see him on, but I did. I did promote the first one. Excellent. Yeah, this is Aaron Cern at the HJM Architects. Right. 
I'm Brent Sills, Talaferro and Brown, 1020 East 8th Street. Obviously, we're, we're excited about this project, continue to serve the neighborhood. Um, we, uh, yeah, we're pr proposing a, pedestrian, or a uh, excuse me, pediatric wing uh, for the hospital. It's gonna uh, provide additional services for the neighborhood. It's gonna solve some parking issues that they've got there. That first level of that garage, it's worth noting that it extends uh, all the way north to south across the site. Um, we understand the concerns about screening. Um, we do have some bands within the architecture that are incorporated that will shield the headlights. And uh, you can kind of see on our landscaping plan that we did, we are aiming to fill it up with landscape. And as we get into species selection, we'll be working with staff to make sure that that's taken care of the concerns. Um, as far as the conditions, I, I think we agree to all of them, save any language about replatting. We don't see the need on this project. And uh, yeah, we're available to take any questions. Can you say that again? Uh, you're okay with the conditions except those that regard platting? Is that what you said? Yes, replatting. Uh, I think Luke is on the phone. We had talked about that in our DAT meeting or our DRC meetings. Uh, there should be no need to replat this property. The chairman, that will be removed with uh, the next round of resubmittal. I did approve a minor subdivision lot split to separate the Samuel Roger property from the proposed apartments. So that need will be removed when we have another round of submittal. That condition will be removed. Okay, which one is that? Can it, is, is it on there the now? Or? Good, Brett? It, the if there's one specifically regarding the replat, but then there's other land development conditions that allude to the plat, which we'd wish we'd uh, request that that language be removed out of there. Uh, 19 is the primary condition, though. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Condition number 19. Any other condition, uh, Brent, while you're at it? No, no, no. I, we're excited to work with you. Okay, I'll make sure to... Uh, Lucas is on the line, I think, Lucas Casper. If he's not, I'll discuss this with him, and when you resubmit, we'll remove it. Okay. Okay, any questions from the commission uh, to the applicant? All right, seeing none. Uh, so at this time, let's go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. If there's anybody out there from the public that would like to speak, hopefully we can see you've raised your hand uh, through Zoom. Chairman Crowd, I would like to testify for the neighborhood at this time, if that's all right. Sure, go right ahead. I would like to say that the applicant has met with the neighborhood on two occasions. Uh, they answered several of our questions, and we have worked with the uh, applicant, Samuel Rogers, with the development of the original building, what we call the Pelican. Uh, we are in support of this um, addition and appreciate the services that Samuel Rogers has provided for the community as well. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else out there that would like to speak uh, regarding docket item number seven? I don't see anyone else. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public testimony then. Um, anything else to add? So I guess this time all the food, so we're just looking at number 19. If there's anything else, uh, Luke, are you available? Yep. Let me okay. get my video on here. Uh, you're, you're looking at docket item number seven, and just we're looking at the removal of any conditions regarded um, platting. So okay. I think number no, number 19 probably addresses that. There weren't any others, were there? Uh, the the pla 17 mentions a plat. Um, let me see here. 
uh, 14 mentions it, but it's it's a whichever comes first comment. Yeah. Um, okay. 13 mentions the plat. So. So is the attention not to plat this? Is that where we're? Is that where we're at? Yeah, we talked about that. There's maybe two private utility easements that go underneath this building that will work out directly with the utilities by separate document. But the zoning's okay. right, the property's right. So it may so. just be an easement, an easement vacation or something of that nature. Then, if you need it, is right. that what you're looking at? Right, and and there's no city uh, utility easements that are affected. Okay, everything's, everything's out in the right of way for. So we're we're basically asking to remove the re requirement to plat the property. Is that where is that where we're at? I apologize. I just kind of I, jumped. I in think here. it's just more the language. Yes. So it'd be revising 13, 14, and 17 to remove language regarding the plat and remove condition number 19 altogether. I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Let me get that again. Was it 13, 14, and 17, Brett? Uh, yes, 13. So clean up the language on 13, 14, 17, and then delete 19. That's correct. Uh, it looks like there is a mention of the flat baked into the end of 18 as well. Now that I look at it. Okay, including 18. So when you resubmit, we will change those languages on 13, 14, 17, 18, and then we will delete 19. Does that work? Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right, so at this time, we'll go ahead and close all testimony and speak amongst the commission. Uh, if there's nothing to say, I'll take a motion, please. Chair Crowell, I move to approve docket item number seven with the removal of condition number 19 and removing the language around platting in conditions 13, 14, 17, and 18. So I need, okay, so I've got a motion and a second for approval of docket item number seven uh, with removal of condition 19 and modifying 13, 14, 17, and 18 to remove the language centered around plat. So Lisa, can you take roll call uh, please mm -hmm. on the motion? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Crowell? Aye. Enders? Aye. And Hill? Aye. Okay, we uh, looks like the motion passes four to none. We appreciate you bringing the project in and thank you for being good stewards to the neighborhood and, and uh, look forward to seeing this project come together. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank thank you. you. All right, let's move on then to docket item number eight. Docket item eight is case number CPC 2021-00211 request to consider rezoning about 32 acres from districts B4-2, B3-2, R-2.5, and R-5 to district UR, and approval of a preliminary development plan, which also serves as a preliminary plat to allow for mixed-use development, including multifamily residential, office and retail, and commercial uses on about 32 acres on the north side of 63rd Street, on both sides of Prospect Avenue for the South Point development. Olafug Baji is the staff planner. Thanks, Joe. Uh, if you can please promote uh, Matt Ebo and uh, Robert Farmer, please. This project is located on the, in the lower midtown, I would say, and more specifically at the uh, at the northeast corner of 63rd and Prospect. Actually, it's on both sides of Prospect Avenue. So the site, again, is located on 63rd Street. Um, Bruce Watkins Drive borders the site on the east. On the north is East 60th Street. And then on the west is Brooklyn. So you can see the Citadel development is to the northeast of a site. <laughs> Research Medical is just to the south of a site. 
existing uh, CVS just south of 63rd Street, and there's an existing gas station at uh, the northeast corner of 63rd and Prospect. Uh, Hogan Preparatory Academy is just off uh, on the east side of uh, Bruce Watkins. Again, this is a 32 acre proposed to be rezoned. And again, straddles uh, Prospect Avenue with pretty much the back or the front of the development along Bruce Watkins and the uh, off ramp. Uh, overall, this used to be the site of the Southtown Urban Life Redevelopment Plan that was approved or never approved and failed back in 2008. Of that overall, and this was about 60 acres development of that plan, the only existing portion within that site is the existing gas station. The site was cleared and the streets are currently barricade, barricaded, so there's no access to the site. Uh, the site also has extensive conservation and open space and stream buffer uh, along the western portion of the site uh, where there's a creek. Um, and the site also have extensive grade changes which presents challenges with uh, uh, the developer and which present overall challenges for street grid and street layout. Um, the plan as proposed proposes to vacate street uh, public streets and utilities, which means they'll be taking out streets, sewer and water, and then rededicating new streets, sewer and water also. So there'll be a new street grade, grade uh, laid out with public and private streets as part of this proposal. And also the site uh, is being zoned UR because it's within the 63rd Street, 63rd and Prospect PIA. Uh, develop planning area, which was approved by the PIA board back in July of 2021. As Joe mentioned, the site is proposed to be a mixed use of multifamily residential office, retail, commercial, is a proposed market, restaurants with drive through and uh, and other just regular sit down restaurants, hotel, uh, storage facility and an anchor tenant, which is proposed to be building G and H. Overall, uh, development square footage is 80,000 square feet, and um, of which uh, there's 250 uh, units residential proposed. Parking is provided in about 13,000, 1,300 parking. This plot again also serves as a preliminary plot, allowing for 13 lots in four phases. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a site, a colored site plan that shows pretty much the proposed uses uh, in blocks. So the area in red is identified, this is building G and H, identified as the anchor uh, retail use. The area along between Prospect on the west and Bruce Watkins on the right is proposed for the hotel. And then as you go down, the proposed market is in green. That's uh, down along East 63rd Street. And then the mixed uses with office um, over the retail are what's highlighted in purple. And that's what's shown here. So, and you also then have the residential component, 250 units here, and that's building L, which is along Prospect and through the interior streets. And the retail, additional retail facility down along Prospect with the, with the existing gas station to be rehab. And the proposed storage building is located on the north. There is a transit component on both sides of Prospect and 63rd Street. So those will be uh, redone and upgraded. This is the phasing plan. Phase one is proposed to be blue. So phase one will bring you the building and everything along Prospect and 63rd, and also the hotel on the east side of Prospect. Uh, phase two, will be working along East uh, 63rd Street and up Olive Street. And then phase three is the major anchor retail, with phase four being the storage and uh, additional uh, retail and 
uh, remodeling or updating of the gas station at the corner. This is the street layout and I'll go to, so this is the existing parcels within this development. And as you can see, the streets within this development is Olive, starts with Park, Olive, Wabash, and then 62nd Street. And uh, this is the proposed layout. So what you see on the left in pink is the streets that are supposed that are proposed to be vacated, including the stop of 60, 61st Street, 60, 62nd Street, and also Olive Park, Olive Wabash. And this is the proposed alignment that shows uh, streets to be realigned into this layout and the stop street within the development. I only included one elevation, but we do have elevation of all the proposed buildings. So I did not want to include uh, all, I think 13 building elevations. This is the proposed elevation of the apartment building. The applicant has also submitted a, a design guideline which staff is working on and we'll make sure that is approved uh, prior to ordinance request. Staff's recommendation of this development is for approval subject to the 51 corrections and conditions, and I will take any questions. The applicant is online, and I think they will fill us on on their public engagement uh, uh, requirement and add any additional information they would like to at this time. Okay. Uh, is part of the application today to um, on these streets, is that today or is that coming back at a different date? In terms of the vacation? Yeah. Yeah, this plan, if approved, will we'll move forward with that vacation, okay. but they will, they are required to apply for the vacations um, following Separate. approval of this plan. So you will be seeing the vacation application shortly. Okay. Sounds good. So any questions from the commission uh, to city staff regarding uh, docket item number eight? Yeah, it, it both a specific question and a, and a general question. With um, this rezoning to district you are, uh, what is the applicant's ability to respond to the market as they're doing their phases and make edits, what, what comes back through this process and what can they do on their own if they determine they wanna make some um, changes to the site plan? From, from our own perspective, there's a, a criteria that allows uh, the director to approve a minor amendment to any approved development plan, and that's capped at 10% increased temp, uh, in uh, overall square footage, 10% increase, I think, in land area. So there's a limited amount the director can approve. If it's deemed a major amendment, they will have to come back to the CPC and the and, uh, city council to receive approval of a major amendment. So once we review what the changes are, we will react to them. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant then. Applicants, are you available? Rob, you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Rob Farmer uh, with Urban America. We're the sponsor of the project. Our address is 1452 Hughes Road, Suite 200, Grapevine, Texas, 76051. And I, again, want to thank you all for hosting this. Uh, we are, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just said welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are tremendously excited about this opportunity in Kansas City. Where re we realize that this has taken uh, many, many years to get to this point. Uh, we've worked tremendously with the city of Kansas City, with the uh, Jeff Williams and, and staff. We've worked with the various departments throughout the city. Uh, on a biweekly basis, probably for close to the last nine months, 
making sure that everybody is working hand in hand to ensure that we all know where the moving parts are, what our milestones are, when those are accomplished, et cetera. Um, in, I wanna speak to the public process and then I wanna turn over to Matt Eblen from uh, McClure Engineering who's worked with us hard on this project as well. Uh, we started our planning effort on this project pre-COVID in 2019 uh, through a planning effort led by McClure Engineering and BRR Architects. Uh, we met with the community through a very public process. Uh, we had no less than three presentations as we were developing uh, this community project. And we worked with uh, them fairly broadly, not only within the confines of the planning process itself, but we also met individually um, with the various entities uh, that are there, the Town Fort Creek Neighborhood Association, uh, the Blue Hills Neighborhood Association, Citadel Neighborhood Association, as well as various um, residents of the community. So in uh, late September, early October of 2019, we approved a preliminary plan. Then as COVID came, um, you know, everybody kind of went pencils down because we weren't sure how things were going to come about. And part of that had to do with our leasing strategy as well as I'm sure you all know the, um, the retail uh, and, and the way that folks have determined that they're doing their shopping patterns is much different in 2022 than it was in 2019. So we re-engaged the community through a process in 2021, again, led by BRR and McClure Engineering. Uh, we've since met with the community no less than four times, making sure that our revisions to the plan, which was presented to you here today, uh, were in, in conjunction with what the community uh, deemed as was acceptable and uh, something that we thought was implementable as well. So we're very pleased with how the plan has come about. We're very pleased with our team as well. And I'm certainly here to answer any questions, but what I'd like to do is to ask Matt Eblen uh, to also speak to some of the matters that uh, that are at hand. Thanks Rob, and thanks everybody for hearing, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Matt Eblen. I work for McClure. Uh, we're an engineering firm located in North Kansas City, 1700 Swift in North Kansas City, specifically zip code 64116. Uh, and just to tag on to what has already been discussed, we have worked in a real collaborative effort uh, for the last several months with all the various departments, with OLAFU, with Jeff Williams and planning, uh, with Chad Thompson at Public Works, because there's this project abuts an upcoming street improvement project along 63rd Street. We've also been in contact and had discussions with Brian Hess with Water Services specific to the Town Fort Creek improvements and upcoming projects that they have going on. I want to make sure I hit them all. Um, certainly with parks, with planning. Uh, yeah, as well as the TIF Commission, certainly that's that's been a very vital player. So uh, we have appreciated the, the collaborative effort and the, and the transparency that we want to show, as well as what the, the city has provided us. So that is, that is the short and sweet of what I have to say. Olafu and, and Rob pretty much said it all otherwise. So. I'll open it up for questions and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. All right, thank you. Any questions from the commission uh, to the applicant regarding this project? Great job. On the, on the residential piece, can you remind us um, what that mix is gonna look like and what target rents are? Sure, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Anders. That is a um, workforce housing development. That'll be 250 units. Um, part of that component will include most likely a 4% uh, tax credit along with the HUD 221D4 financing. So we will comply with the uh, city's expectations for affordable housing there. Uh, in terms of what the market rents are going to be, uh, those are still being set, but uh, know that that project will be a workforce housing development uh, with the affordable component uh, within the 250 unit project. Sounds good. Anybody else have any questions? All right, so at this time, let's go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. If there's anybody out there that would like to speak uh, regarding docket item number eight, please raise your hand and you will be called upon. Well, um, I don't see any people in the list with their hand raised. 
Um, I would ask attendees who are interested, since I don't totally trust the hand feature right now, if they could just chat that they're interested in a case, then that way we know to promote you. But Mr. Chair, no one has raised their hand for this case. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, we'll go ahead and close public testimony then. Uh, anything else, uh, Mr. Farmer or Mr. Evelyn, regarding this project? No, this not time? at this time. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so at this time, we'll go ahead and close all testimony. Uh, if there's nothing to discuss for, with the commission, I will take uh, a motion, please. I just for me, I, I think this statement just needs to be said. It's uh, it's a great project. It's been a long time coming. Um, it's something very welcomed in this area, and uh, I really look forward to seeing this come together. Um, it's exciting to see this corridor, you know, come together. And thank you, Mr. Farmer, uh, for your time and efforts in this. You're quite welcome. And thank you, the city of Kansas City, for welcoming us uh, as they've done over the last few years. Yeah. Chair Crowell, I just want to double down on that. I mean, I've seen a lot of um, the community go through a lot of hopeful wishing for that corridor to be developed. And I think uh, I don't live too far from there, so I passed the soccer complex over here and I see tons of families that come from all over Kansas City to use the soccer complex and there's nowhere to eat. There's nowhere to go to sit down with your family. Folks are bringing lunches, sitting in cars and oftentimes it's also during the, you know, uh, less favorable weather. So I'm glad to see that uh, we're able to capture folks that are coming into Kansas City that might not live in Kansas City and spending some of those dollars uh, in our community. So thank you again, Mr. Farmer, I'm in support of the project. I can, uh, make a motion um, yep, please do yeah thank you get, let me figure out what docket item this is now i was looking at number eight number eight chair Crowell, i move to approve docket item eight as uh is that right no i'm sorry wait, yeah, docket eight. Are yeah. we, what conditions are stated yes second all right i've got a motion and a second for approval of docket item number eight with conditions stated Lisa, can you take roll call on that motion, please? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crowell? Aye. Enders? Aye. And Hill? Aye. Okay, motion passes uh, five to none. Again, thank you for bringing the project in and good luck as you move forward. We look forward to seeing you when you come back. Thank you so much. All right. So commission, we've got a couple of cases left. Um, and I, I think I need to take like a, maybe a 10 minute break here real quick uh, before we hear those last two cases, if that's all right. So uh, Joe, let's do that uh, 10 minute break. It's 12 o'clock now and be back by 12, 10. Is that enough time? All right, see you all. Well, if, you're, if you're still there, I think you had more air time than Bill Self this weekend. It was, it was fun seeing a whole lot of you. No, me? Yeah. No, of Olafu. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, I mean, it was amazing. I was showing everyone. I was like, look. That was, that was like, I know awesome this man. guy. Yeah, that was, that was fun. All right, twelve ten. Yep.
Okay, it's 12.10, is everybody back? I am. I yes, know. I'm here. All right. So looking for Bruce and uh, Sarah's back. Kukithia. All right. Is our applicant back for docket item number 10? Yeah, she's in. Um, oh, number 10. I don't know. I'm, I'd, I'd look to Anna to notify me who that is. Doug Stockman has raised his hand. OK, he's he's available. Uh, Commissioner Hill, you back? I'm here. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, uh, welcome back to the meeting. Thanks for the uh, short break there. So we're now ready for docket item number 10. Thank you. Joe, can you open the case, please? Yes. Case number ROW 2021-00037, request to vacate an alley located north of West 40th Street between State Line Road on the west and Bell Street on the east to allow for a construction of a new apartment building. Anna Nanaski is the staff cleaner. Thank you. Okay, as mentioned, docket item number 10 focuses on a property roughly located at 39th and State Line. Uh, the property is currently zoned R2.5, but recently the City Planning Commission and the City Council approved to rezone this area to R-0.3. And this, uh, the subject vacation uh, is being brought before us to approve a vacation on the south side of the subject property to vacate an alley. Um, the area plan amendment, the rezoning, and the development case associated with this project are CDC CPC 2021-00181-183 and 184. So the subject site is located in the midtown portion of Kansas City. As previously mentioned, it's roughly at the location of the intersection of 39th Street and State Line Road. The subject property is highlighted in yellow with, it's a little hard to see on the screen now that I realize it, but the alley in question, it's the very southern portion of the site and is highlighted in orange. Uh, there are some very popular restaurants along the 39th Street corridor also with KU Med uh, being adjacent to the property to the west in Kansas, just for some landmark recognition of the subject site. This is the site plan associated with the subject vacation. It is oriented uh, where north points to the left of the screen. This is so the entire uh, site plan can be viewed uh, a little bit larger scale on the PowerPoint presentation. You can see the alley over to the right hand side of the screen. It is highlighted in yellow. And city staff, we recommend approval subject to conditions. Uh, the applicant is requesting for the alley to be vacated to accommodate for a little bit more room for their development on the subject site. Um, again, approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the commission regarding docket item number 10? Anna, I just want to, what, what's on the, what's on the left hand side, sorry, right hand side, are they properties or who owns the properties? on the right hand side of those alleys of the alley. The, the alley actually runs east west. So you're looking on the south side. I'm looking at, yeah, if I look at, uh, well, the south to north, I suppose, I, I, 
I, I know the area, uh, but I just can't remember whether there's any properties. Yeah, it, there are a few uh, residential uh, lots and a commercial building. I can share my screen of the parcel viewer real quick. Did that, nope, hold on. Okay, can you see the parcel viewer? Yep. Okay, so here's the LED in question. Here are the residential lots into the commercial building. So we're cutting off, are we cutting off access to the, for Correct. those? Correct, the entire alley is being proposed to be vacated. The consent form associated with um, vacating the alley uh, affecting the adjacent property owners is attached to the staff report. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the commission? All right. Let's go ahead and welcome the applicant. Good afternoon, Mr. Stockman. Good afternoon. Thank you for all the commissioners for hearing the case. Um, I I think that the only thing that I would really like to add to Anna's very good description is just that the while it's currently designated an alley, it's actually not functioning as an alley at this time. Uh, it is kind of a combination of there's a partial retaining wall and fence between the commercial property and the property to the north. Uh, I think the residents may have some grass on either one of the sides and they have been amenable as the consent form shows um, with this ownership group um, to vacate the alley as they will sort of take over part of that path of it. So there doesn't seem to be any any um, argument within the neighborhood about vacating the alley based on all of our conversations with the neighbors. Okay. Any questions from the commission to the applicant? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and open it up for any public testimony. So if there's anybody out there that would like to speak regarding docket item number 10, please raise your hand and you'll be called upon. Mr. Chair, there's no one raising their hand in the list and no one has chatted um, that they would like to speak either. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public testimony then. Uh, anything else to add, Mr. Stockman? Okay, uh, so at this time, we'll go ahead and close testimony and speak amongst the commission. Um, if there's nothing to discuss, I'll take a motion, please. Chair Crowell, I move to approve docket item number 10 with conditions. Okay. Second. All right, so I have a motion and a second for approval of docket item number 10 with conditions stated. Lisa, can you take roll call, please, on that motion? All right, I'll do it. Um, Enders? You can't hear me? No. Now we can. Oh, yeah. weird. Okay, Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crowell? Aye. Enders? Aye. And Hill? Aye. All right, looks like the motion passes five to none, and that was a good sprint there, uh, Commissioner Hill. Aye. All right, uh, thank you for bringing that in, and uh, good luck as you move forward. Thank you very much. All right. All right, let's hear the last case on the docket. Uh, doc let's see, docket item number 12, please. It is case number CPC 2022-00007, a request to approve a major amendment to a previously approved development plan in District B2-2 to allow for mixed use development, which includes 31,000 square feet of retail, including convenience store retail office and drive through and multifamily residential development consisting of 144 units and four buildings on 13 acres at the northwest corner of 169 and Northwest Shoal Creek Parkway. Uh, Olaf Agbaji is the staff winner. Thanks, Joe. 
I see Patricia Jensen is already on, so she is the applicant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, Olafua Baji. Uh, again, this case is come, this case coming before you today is located in the Northland, where my arrow is pointing, just off uh, 169 and 435. Closer location. It's actually at the north. East yeah. We're not seeing your screen. Sorry about that. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Enders, are you still on? He is. I, I am on, yeah. I was uh, yeah, just looking you at the might, project. You might want to know this involves a partnership between um, Bristol South um, Investments LLC and Syndicate, which is Paul okay. Nagoka. Yeah, I, I will abstain. I'll recuse myself. Yeah, I I thought that might happen. So, okay. So just so you know, we've got four commissioners on on this particular case: uh, Commissioner Allender, myself, Commissioner Hill, and Commissioner Beasley. Correct. Okay. That's what. That's why I was asking in the chat whether certain people were on because I couldn't see them. Sure. Okay. Sorry, Olafu. I think we Sorry. see your screen now. Uh, Uh, like I said, this site is located in the Northland, just off uh, 169 and just out of 435. More specifically at the northeast corner of our Show Creek Parkway and uh, 169 Highway. Let me go back real quick. This site is actually part of the overall communities at Bristol. This was approved, I think, back in 1991. This is the commercial component called Bristol Plaza. And to the south of the site, uh, we have uh, Holly Farms and we have Mori Mount Moriah uh, Cemetery. And uh, we have Northland Christian School to the south. And we do have Cadence. Uh, single family residential development that we've been approving over the years, just at the southeast corner of Flat Purchase and, and uh, Show Creek Parkway. Thank you. Um, this specific project site, which is the Bristol Plaza area was approved back in 2000. And, um, and the first, project that was constructed on this site was done in 2019, which I'll show you. The gas station, um, you, uh, City Plan Commission, I think November of last year approved the convenient gas station and convenience store. That was a project plan to allow that to move forward. So this proposal is before you today because it's a major amendment of the current approved plan. And this amendment is to allow for container homes along the north side. Um, this is similar to the same uh, proposal that you saw on Antioch Manor. So this amendment to the current approved plan will allow for a mixed use development that will include the 144 multifamily residential development, proposing 192 parking spaces. And this will be the same three-story uh, tall container buildings uh, with parking within the courtyard. The overall project then will allow for 30,000 square feet of commercial office use, including a retail and drive through with about 264 parking spaces. Um, they will also adjust the overall phasing plan from nine to six and also then create, I think they're proposing three lots, uh, potential for further subdivision to up to six lots and the existing approved project, which is the existing retail uh, street building and also the existing gas station will remain as approved. <laughs> Again, this is the site, uh, existing single family homes uh, within uh, communities at Bristol's. Uh, to the north of the site is uh, Bristol patio homes. So those are your single uh, family detached patio homes. And that's the existing approved building on the site. This is the 2000 plan that was approved. And as you can see, we had nine potential lots of which only one and two have been developed. And it allowed for retail commercial uses 
along the northern part of the building or the site with the convenience store and additional uh, drive through facility, a bank and another uh, retail store at this location. This is the proposed amendment again to go down to six. So allow this existing retail building to stay, allow the convenience store to remain and also approve the apartment component thereby making it a mixed use allowing for the 144 apartment units at this location and allow, still allow for development of the three pad sites along uh, Shell Creek Parkway. Shell Creek Parkway has been improved. Um, the parkway under the jurisdiction of uh, the Parks and, Parks and Recreation Department, um, 169 is a freeway and then summit um, is the main entrance into uh, the, the Bristol's communities at, at Bristol Park. The site will have two access, which is already existing, uh, improved with sewer and water all existing. And main access will be off summit with uh, single access of uh, uh, Show Creek Parkway. This is the proposed uh, layout that was submitted and we did re receive revised plans for this actual uh, container homes. And one of the contention between staff and the applicant is that this is an amendment to the development plan and staff wants a standalone development plan for the container homes, but the applicant wants it to be the same plan instead of providing a separate plan. Other than that, staff, again, the container uh, building is the same building we saw with the uh, with um, Antioch Manor, the same color, the same layout, and the same presentation. Uh, so we had the same architectural uh, conditions on this also, as the building faces uh, 169, which is a public right away. And staff's recommendation is to approve our subject to the 27 corrections and conditions. And that will end my report. Okay, thank you, Olafu. Any questions from the commission uh, to city staff? Can you kind of explain again why you're looking for a, a a standalone development plan on this uh, versus encompassing the whole thing? Um, I can go back and show you again. This is a, a about an 11 acre site that has a six lots of which two have been developed and we have uh, four more lots to develop. So this amendment is to the current approved chapter 80 development plan. So when we are amending this plan, you usually then have project plan, which we have had, which we have done for the two existing sites. So let me go back and show you and share the current approved plan with you. So if you see, so we have approved the project plan for this site. We've also approved the project plan for this site. Yeah, we can't see so, your screen again. Sorry. Too many buttons to click. So we've approved the project site for this two part sites and we've approved the project plan for the gas station. This plan before you today is the approved chapter 80 overall development plan. So this amendment we are dealing with today has to do with the overall development plan. That is 11 acres. Of this site, we need a separate plan for that specific site, which is smaller than the current approved development plan. All the conditions contained in this will be for the overall development site, which will then be binding to all six parcels. So as you yeah. can see, this development plan also is called 
South Bristol Center, which was the residential district. The plan submitted now is called, I think, South Bristol Container Homes. And we do have we do have all the information necessary to push this forward. The only thing we do not have for this right now is the revised elevation that we have called for, which is supposed to give us a different treatment on the areas that faces the public right away. So, and we did not get that back. So. Olufu, I think you're relying upon 88 section 88-25-01 in the ordinance, right? Yep, that's the top. The I'll share my screen to show the commission that information. And it's this section right here, I believe, that I'm highlighting. It says site specific development plans approved after January 1st, 2006, and before January 1st, 2016 will remain valid until January 1st, 2018, unless the phasing plan or different lapse of approval date was approved at the time. The site-specific development plan received final approval. Plans which remain in effect shall follow the provisions of this code as follows. For an amendment to a chapter 80 development plan, which is what this is, it must be submitted per 88.516 and 517. For a final plan required under chapter 80, a project plan must be submitted per 88.516 and 88.518. So I think what Olufu is saying is that we're doing an amendment now to a chapter 80 plan. And per this provision, they have to do a project plan later before they can get a building permit on this development. Okay. They're just trying to not have to do that at this time, I I take it, right now? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the commission on this? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and welcome the applicant. Uh, Good afternoon, Ms. Jensen. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Um, Joe or Olafu, I believe you've got um, Brian Mertz. Troy Paul, who is in the in place in the absence of Paul Nagoka because he could not be here. Um, Scott Roseman and Paul Osborne that you might permit if there's promote if there's questions, they'll be available to answer them. Um, Olafu, can you pull up my PowerPoint I sent you? Thank you. You see it? Yep, yeah. I do. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. As you recall, you heard a case similar to this that was located on um, south of I-35 on Antioch Road um, at your last meeting called Antioch Manor. Um, this is called Bristol South Shipping Container Apartments. And I'll, I'll go... Um, quickly through the slides since a number of you have seen them before, but I believe Commissioner Allender was not present during that meeting. So he may be interested in seeing Mm -hmm. uh, a great solution to providing workforce housing at an affordable cost rather than some of the market rates that are being charged now. So next slide, please. Um, This provides Paul Nagoka's background. He is partnering with Brian Mertz on this site. Um, Paul has, and I'll just briefly describe him. He's the one who is constructing the um, studio shipping container units at I-35 and Southwest Traffic Way. Um, Those are all 320 um, square feet studio units. These are not 320 square feet studio units. There are smaller units, but there are both one and two bedroom units so that they'll provide housing for workforce um, families um, to be able to live in a safe and secure place. Paul studied these shipping containers and the conversion of shipping containers for about 15 years before bringing his first project online. So. He's really excited to be 
um, providing this type of product in Kansas City, Missouri. The next slide. Next slide, Olafu. As, as Olafu has described, we're asking that you approve the major amendment to a previously approved development plan to allow the construction and development of Bristol South Shipping Container Apartments, which is a uh, 144 unit multifamily development. The next slide, you've seen this from Olafu's presentation. So that red star is on the area of the property that we're going to be constructing these on. The next slide. Um, this is really what Paul used as he traveled both the country and traveled internationally to look at these types of developments. So this is the, these are slides of various projects in Vancouver and California that have been constructed. The next slide. So as we all know, there's a citywide shortage of workforce housing options. Um, and a lot of times they come with tax incentive requests because it's difficult to meet um, and provide for this housing. The use of, of shipping containers, which otherwise would have been dropped at the bottom of the ocean, not at, only is environmentally friendly, but it also helps provide market rate rents that families can afford. And this slide shows that our estimated apartment um, rental rate is about $800 to $1,375 per unit. That would be the two bedroom units that are provided. So this meets the city's goals with a, of providing workforce housing without tax incentives. The next slide. This is a slide that Olafu has already shown you, which is the current approved um, development plan. The next slide is the amended development plan we have in front of you. And the next slide is a photo rendering of what the, the development will look like after um, construction. And then the next two slides are the revised elevations we sent to, we uploaded to Compass as a result of city staff comments asking us to break up buildings and the like, um, which is similar what, to what we did at Antioch Manor. The next slide, <clears throat> next after that one, uh oh, is just the interior finishes. As Paul explained to you a, num a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago now, what he has really found with his um, surveying of what people want out of rental units is really to fine tune the finishes. So the inside is beautiful and very efficient. Um, and this is an example of the unique designs and the finishes. The next slide is the public engagement slide. We held a public engagement meeting with the Bristol South adjacent neighbors on March 1st, 2022. This is the meeting sign-in sheet that we uploaded as a result of that meeting. And, and I felt we had very positive feedback from the adjacent neighbors who attended the meeting. The next slide is the revised site plan, concept plan colored up as a rendering following the meetings with city planning. As you can see in the middle of the site, we broke up the buildings to create a pedestrian path across the site. Um, and we've done other things, including enhancing landscaping and making sure that we had pedestrian paths. Um, the next slide, and this is what Olafu uh, has referenced. I don't think Olafu or Olafu will have an objection to the bottom request is that we're requesting that you delete condition number four, because that is the condition that st states we have to hold a public engagement meeting. And we complied with that um, requirement in the city's code. So then we would like 
to revise condition number three um, to read that we submit a project plan for any development on lot two. So that's the remaining pad sites that we don't have specific elevations for um, or that we have specific plans in terms of landscaping, screening, um, pedestrian ways and things like that. Um, I point to the next slide shows that section 88-518-02-E says as a condition of approval of a development plan, project plan review and approval may be required to allow review of in any information required by 88-517 not available during the development review plan and approval process. And then I've attached several slides after that to show you how detailed our plans have been with regards to the shipping container project. And we've submitted a lighting plan, we've submitted a landscaping plan, we've submitted grading plans, we've submitted all the architectural renderings. Um, and for that reason, we would ask you to revise condition number th three, um, just to insert that we have to submit that project plan for any development on lot two. Um, and with that, we're anxious to, to get going and providing workforce housing in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of looking at the uh, like development plan. It looks like it's lot three. Is that the one that's to the, like the Southwest corner? Cause uh, lot two is where the shipping uh, is going. The, the development plan is lot, well, the three pad sites is lot two, as lot, the other lot. Lot two is the shipping container site. <laughs> and we've already constructed a spec building, commercial building, um, just to the west of that, which we've already done and gotten all our permits for. And then on the south side of the shipping container adjacent to 152, is the convenience store with gas sales that you approved. Um, and that will be under construction soon. So the remaining part of the site is the site um, to the west of the access drive between the access, the access drive and Summit Street, just on the north side of Shoal Creek Parkway. And uh, Commissioner Crowley, you may remember this, this uh, plan was approved a number, the overall plan was approved a number of years ago. There was a NID associated with it, which failed. Um, and the, the Bristol South Investments, Brian Mertz has come in um, since that failure and acquired the property and moved forward with getting the development, which the city anticipated a number of years ago. Okay. All right, any questions from the commission to the applicant regarding this project? I have a, can we go back to the landscaping? Yeah, actually it's one of the end sheets, Olafu. My question really again, is they detention basins for stormwater management And there are some, I believe, in the, yeah, they're in the landscaping area. Yes. Was there any thought given again? Type of feature? For the Commissioner. Family? Yeah, Commissioner Allender, you're cutting out on me. Uh, but, okay. But, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, was there any thought of, uh, of, of converting that or looking at green infrastructure versus just putting detention basins in um, just from a livability perspective with regards to constructed wetlands or, or some, some feature versus just detention basins on the landscaping plan. I can ask Paul Osborne to address that. Um, I don't know if he plans on putting the 
native plantings within the detention basin to help with the BMP counts. Paul? Yes, the landscape plan does call out um, four inch container plants in both detention basin areas in the uh, hatch legend. So that's similar to what we did at 75th and Flintlock pursuant to your comment, Commissioner Allender. <clears throat> okay, so no thought of a constructed wetland or anything like that, just to make it a better water feature. Paul? We can give that some further thought. Um, the elevations in this area may not allow us to have any retained uh, water, but we can consider um, some other BMP options. Yeah, I would like you to consider some. I, I think just having detention basins, everybody that's their default going uh, on development, but I'd like to see a little bit more thought given around green infrastructure, especially when you've got residential um, um, areas uh, just to make it a nicer feature from a livability perspective for the, for the residents. Uh, we certainly can consider that. It, I mean, it's a question of whether or not it works with this site. But I certainly would like to put some condition in there that you will consider it. Mm, I'm not sure what teeth we can put in as a commission, but um, but certainly I'd like to see some some something written down that you are going to consider um, some different green infrastructure features. Joe, I'm not sure how we do that, but I'd like to put that in as it's uh, certainly as a part of the condition of our food. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any questions from the commission? I'm still a little confused on what are we, this, the plan versus the overall plan. Just, I'm still a little confused on what are we approving. Commissioner Allender, there's just a, a difference between staff and us where we believe we provided all the detail that is required for the project plan as it relates to the shipping container development, not for the remaining three pad sites that have to be developed. And for that reason, that's why I've asked you to revise condition three that says, that says as it relates to lot two, which is the three remaining pad sites yet to come before you for some type of plan approval. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think it's just that. Um, I think it's the pro provisions that I shared on the screen and in our interpretation require a project plan, whether or not sufficient detail is provided now. Um, now, maybe that provision that shouldn't be in the ordinance, but it is. And we've often required it, um, well, we've always required it in a case of a chapter 80 plan, which is a plan approved under the former ordinance as this one was, um, that, that ordinance required the equivalent of a project plan today, what we call a project plan today. And so what we're suggesting is that applying that requirement to this plan is what we have to do because it was originally approved under the old ordinance. So, I think what, what I'm interpreting the applicant is suggesting is that they want that provision um, waived on their project. And I'm not sure that we can do that. I guess I'd ask Sarah to, jump, to weigh in on that. And Joe, I'm happy to continue discussing this with you. To me, this is, a, this is the site, I, the provision I pointed to provides that you don't have to have a project plan if you included sufficient detail in your right. development. I, I think plan. that that, 
provision just applies to chapter 88 projects that are approved originally approved under chapter 88 and this was not I'm happy to continue discussing it with you. I mean, the commission can go ahead and approve it subject to the conditions with just deleting condition number four and you and I can continue talking about it. Chair Crow, um, well, I guess I can wait um, to see once we get to the commission, but would like to hear um, what is the staff recommendation um, based on uh, Ms. Jensen's you know, recommendations. Yeah, I'd kind of like to hear Sarah weigh in as well. Mm -hmm. She's tried it twice. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to pull that code section up on my desktop and I'm I don't know why, but it's it's just moving so slowly I can't pull it up. All right, we'll come back and let's go ahead and if there's any other questions from the commission, and then we'll go to public comment then. So are there any questions from the commission? Uh, regarding this docket item 12? Yeah, how many stories are these? Um, I believe there are two. Oh, two or three, there are three. So has there Paul? been any, any conversation on uh, entry and exit? What kind of material and stuff has taken place with that? Yes, there's, there's, we've submitted very detailed architectural renderings. And Scott Roseman, do you want to address that? Yes, good afternoon. The entries to these units uh, will be through exterior breezeways with exterior staircases that access a, a landing in between the shipping containers uh, that then serve as the entrance into the units. What are they made of? They'll be made of steel and wood and concrete in, in different architectural uh, compositions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, uh, seeing none, let's go ahead and open it up for public testimony. If there's anybody out there that would like to speak uh, regarding docket item number 12, please raise your hand and you'll be called upon. Mr. Chair, no one's raising their hand or chatting about it. Okay, so go ahead and close public testimony then. Uh, Sarah, were you able to bring that up? Or Joe, do you have that available for to see? Yeah, I can share it on my screen again. Yeah, that so, would help. I think there's something wrong with mini code right now. <laughs> okay. Sarah, it's this provision right here. Can you see it? Is it big enough to read? Yeah, I can enlarge it on my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, and you're saying, Joe, that this one falls under subsection A? Yes, we, we it was believe it does. When yeah. was it approved? Also, do you know the date? 2000. 2000. Okay, but how many times was it amended after that? It's been amended since, right? Not this section, though. Not the. No, on the, on the overall plan, Joe, we proceeded with the project plans, which are your final plans on both that built the spec building that now houses Blush Fitness. And we proceeded for the convenience store with the project plan because we didn't have detailed architectural renderings or any of the other details at the time um, that the original plan was approved. So this is being amended as an amended development plan and we have much more details in terms of the shipping container project. Okay, what's the basis then, Joe, for your opinion that it, this one needs a project plan? 
Well, because it was approved in chapter under chapter 80 and Olafu was wasn't there a condition in the ordinance requiring a final plan? Yep, I can pull that up. So okay. that last sentence there so says a final plan under chapter 80, a project plan must be submitted per 516 and 518. Okay. And my belief is that ignores the fact that we're coming in with an amended development plan that has the details that are called for. It seems, it seems unnecessary in my mind to cause further time delays or cause further um, costs for a project when we have all that detail contained in the plan. But the, the sentence, the second to the last sentence says for an amendment to a chapter 80 plan, a development plan must be submitted for this. For a final plan required under chapter 80, a project plan application must be submitted for 516 and 518. So those were clearly stated that way because once you are vested and you retain that chapter 80 right, which you then use by building your first two projects or getting them approved, you are down that route where you have to do a project plan for each phase. So that was never contemplated to go down a one development plan that approves a project within that development. I think when you're amending that plan, you can provide for that, but you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm happy to continue this discussion. And you can leave the condition as stated in the plan or in the staff report. And that really only affects uh, condition number three, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I've asked you to eliminate four because that's the public engagement condition. I don't know why that keeps popping up. Okay. Any thoughts from the commission on that? So if we leave a condition in that is later taken out, does that have to come back to us? Nope. No. No. Okay, just confirm it. Thank you. Okay. So, so we're a staff on that then, if that's the case. I'd just like to hear back from Sarah and staff on, on that again. I would think there, well, there should be a project plan. And we've asked for it since the first round of review, which if submitted would have been probably be, be before you today. Because it's a project plan that just approved by city plan commission. What this amendment to the plan does, it kind of works on the entire site and make sure everything is connected where you, and then you come in with each, each individual part site. They're allowed but, to do concurrent submittal, which they could have done. So, but if we were, if we're leaving, if we're leaving a mem if we're leaving three in, that still means that they've got to do the plan, right? If we, if we're leaving a, a comment three in, that means that they're still committed. They're still committed to do the plan. We haven't actually relieve them of that obligation today. That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right, any other thoughts, commissioners? No, I'd still want something. I'd still like some comment. I don't know where we put a different, a, a new comment in with regards to them looking at um, different types of green infrastructure versus retention basins within the landscaping. Mr. Allender, I would think you'd add it to that condition number three. If you're gonna leave three, read the same. I would just add at the end, a photometric study showing zero foot candles at the property line and consideration for green infrastructure on the site within the detention basins prior to the issuance of a building permit.
I, I, Joe Awafu, any comments on it? That does that would that satisfy my comment? No, I, I think what I hear you saying is you want them to do it. All that would mean is that they need to try, and we would have nothing to force them to do it. I have. Yeah, I had understood he wanted us to consider it because we got to decide, we got to be able to determine it's appropriate for the site, given the topography. That would be, that would be true. And that's what a final pl uh, uh, project plan would have done because it would be site specific, not the overall development plan specific. So when he, when they come with their own site specific specific project plan is when you look at that actual uh, the stormwater requirement for that or if it's a regional system and putting it on the overall development is so every condition we put on here goes on the overall development we want a project plan that then gets its own condition for that site specific site and i did check uh, uh joe mr chairman i did check the ordinance it had a condition that they should submit a final plan to CPC prior to issuance of any building permit in the controlling ordinance. So they'll come back again. Uh, we want them to come back again. They don't want to come back again. So what they've done is they try to piggyback the apartment on the overall amendment to allow for the apartment to occur. What this plan should be is to amend the development plan to change the uses on the northern part from commercial residential, uh, commercial and office and retail to apartment. And how do you now tie the apartment to the rest of the development within that? And then the apartment plan should be separate from this. So that's the difference, the main difference. And now we will talk about the apartment side being tied to this development with a project plan. And everybody, she's done that for the first two part sites but she just wants this to go on instead of bringing it separately. I, I'm trying to make it more efficient in terms of time and cost. And all of would have been Olafu, applying for he, concurrent application like we all, always do. In Olafu, the Antioch case, you submitted well, three applications. So you submitted for an area plan amendment, a rezoning, and another. So in this case, you should have submitted uh, an application for an amendment and a project plan and would have reviewed those. And then the correction for the overall site goes on the amendment and the correction for your site specific goes on uh, or the conditions for your site goes on your site. Now I'm applying condition of an overall site and I'm gonna be issuing a building permit for one of the sites without tying those conditions. You're asking for stormwater for that specific project that I'm going to condition the entire site to go with. So that's the main difference we're talking about. Well, we've submitted a final plat to create the lot too. And all of that stormwater will come with the final plat. If I had been told- Stormwater does not come with final plat. Stormwater yes, would have come yes, with a project Yes, it does. Plan. I do it all the time with final plats. <clears throat> you know, we don't have to get into these arguments. We had a pre-application meeting. That wasn't the recommendation at the pre-application meeting. I will live with condition number three as written. And that was a recommendation at DRC. Once we, uh, we applied and that's the same condition at DRC. And I responded back and never heard from anybody. And then Joe set up, a, wanted a Zoom call last Friday. I sat on it for 30 minutes waiting for him to get on so we could discuss this and no, and no one bothered to get on. Hey guys, just so I'm clear, um, uh, as we're moving, we are wanting to approve this with the conditions as stated. Correct? I believe. Yeah. I believe. I believe so, except for deleting condition number four, which just deals with that we've got to conduct the public engagement meeting because we've already conducted it. Okay. All right. That can be removed. Yeah. And can we can we add something in regards to uh, green infrastructure um, as long as it fits the, the site. I understand they have to have a look at the site to make sure that all 
fits and they, they can comply, but a different type of BMP, uh, whether that's constructed wetlands or I don't want to really, I want them to look at different types, but I, I certainly want, if they can fit something in that fits with site, then I, I would like to have have that in there. But, it, but because they haven't had a chance to look at what type of BMPs, then it's hard to say, yes, you've got to do it because I understand you've got to fit it into, into the site and so forth as well. So I don't know whether yeah. we can make them, but certainly I, I would like them if if they can fit it in and show evidence that they've tried, then then that would satisfy. Commissioner, so. I, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I was just wondering from uh, Olufu, would that more detailed? Uh, be attached to the site specific plan that they have to come back through or do we or is it wise to go ahead and add it here there's a condition number 12 by ldd that the developer must submit a micro storm drainage study i don't know if luke or amy can help modify that to capture that in the to capture that requirement in that condition will that work lucas I think Amy is still on the line, so. No, I don't see Amy. I think on the Flintlock case, when we dealt with that parking lot, we placed it within the um, plan, the MPD final plan requirement. So that's why I was suggesting it be put in three that's similar to a final MPD plan. We didn't put it in the storm drainage study condition, Olafu. There was a condition for a project plan or for a final MPD There are final MPD plan in 7535 North Flintlock. So can we amend condition number three to include that then? I and think what, what, yes, that's what I said, is that we would agree to a condition that included consideration of green infrastructure within the site and the detention, the proposed detention ponds. And uh, if they submit a project plan, it will come back to City Plan Commission, and that will give you an opportunity to see what's proposed at that time, Commissioner Allender. Okay. So we will amend condition number three to add uh, the sentence. Patricia, can you, do you mind reading that? I believed I said lighting, comma, a photometric study showing zero foot candles at the property lines and consideration of green infrastructure within the site and the detention basins prior to issuance of the building permit. And then we'll get another look at that. Okay. Just send me the language, Patricia, when after the meeting, please. Okay. Our food, I just want to make sure we get another look at it before we approve it, right? But what? We'll get another look at it before we for, for final approval. Yeah, Only it'll just be more details. Okay. Yes, you will. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, anything else we need to discuss? Um, I believe at this time we need to go ahead and close all testimony then and uh, speak amongst the commission. And it seems like we've already got everything talked about, so I'll, I'll take a motion, please. Okay, I'll try it. Um, Chair Crowell, I move to approve docket item 12, um, deleting condition four and revising condition three as stated to include um, consideration of green infrastructure on the site and proposal of detention ponds. It was better stated by uh, Ms. Jensen. Okay. All right. So I've got a motion. Second. 
So I've got a motion in a second for approval of docket item number 12 uh, with removal of condition three uh, or uh, removal of condition four and modifying condition three uh, to add consideration of green infrastructure within the site and detention pond prior to issuance of the building permit. Um, so with that, Lisa, can you take roll call, please? Commissioner Allender? Aye. Beasley? Aye. Crow? Aye. And Hill? Aye. Okay, it looks like the motion passes for approval of the project with stated changes to the condition. So thank you for bringing it in and I'll be anxious to see this one come together up there thank in Northland. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I believe that takes us through all of our docketed items. Uh, Commissioner Enders, are you still there? Yes, I am. I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I was just kind of curious how things are going with the Municipal Arts Commission. Um, yeah, so going well, sorry, I took off my headphones. My audio might be different. Um, I recently had a great conversation with Councilwoman Shields about changing the encroachment process. So uh, city staff had worked on this a few years ago, and I think it hit some sort of snag and it's now being reconsidered. Essentially what happened is a lot of developers were getting upset about um, the murkiness of the process. So for example, and then the commission was getting upset too. So uh, taking a quick step backwards, if there's an encroachment on a city property, whether it's something overhanging the, the street or whether it's spilling out onto the sidewalk that gets seen by this, the um, Municipal Arts Commission. And a lot of commissioners were, were uh, felt unprepared or unqualified to determine whether something can and should uh, encroach on the property, which is actually technically not what their role is. The role is to determine the aesthetics of something that encroaches. So anyway, there was a lot of confusion and um, people were coming post construction. So that whether it was a skyscraper that had something um, leaning out over the street or whether it was um, stairs or, or an ADA access. So anyway, um, because people didn't know if they needed to come to Municipal Arts Commission first or if the city could sign off on it, sometimes things were, things were coming after uh, city plan or city after city council had approved it. We're now going to reduce the amount of things that the Municipal Arts Commission needs to see. So that's the thing that directly um, relates to City Planning Commission. And I think it was nice that I was able to help facilitate that based upon what I've learned from you all in this world. It was an area that I could add some guidance and expertise and, and really just help um, coordinate. But then on the art side, um, the public arts administrator, James Martin has been doing an absolutely fantastic job finding money places for public art. And so the 1% uh, for the arts program is the main source of arts funding. And it's, that takes up a large portion of his uh, role and the Municipal Arts Commission's role. And through the GO bonds that were issued a few years ago, he's been able to find projects, whether it's improving a street or something, and he's been able to create opportunities for public art. Um, and he's had a really big focus on the districts that have less artwork than other districts. And so that's where he's spending most of his energy. Um, the airport project was the biggest uh, city funding of art ever. And so that part was, that project was done incredibly well. The, the process was something that I was incredibly proud of as a Kansas City, and it was very um, representative. They got a lot of different voices. So all in all, and that was a lot, but it's been um, a tremendous pleasure and honor to be in your role. So thanks for letting me do that, uh, Chair Crow. And it's, it's just been fun to see um, the way that our city's working to embrace art. The, the current public administrator, James Martin, stepped into a role that had kind of been a revolving door of people and had interim people. And so he's really picking up a lot of the pieces. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there about that. I meant to kind of reach out to you before, but I was kind of curious how things are going on the Municipal Arts Commission. I assume that's something you still would like to continue doing. It's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. And yeah, I'm, I'm, if anyone else wants to jump in, I'm more than willing to let someone else enjoy that process, but uh, otherwise I enjoy it and appreciate it. Yes. I mean, I get to serve as a well, ex facto, but really 
I don't think I'm the right person for that because I like lines to be straight and colors to be solid. Um, whereas uh, this, you know, has some curvy things and <laughs> different colors along the spectrum, and I'm not good at picking those out. If it doesn't have the alligator up top on the shirt and in the pants, then I don't know that it matches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything else anybody would like to add? Um, just start really look at your schedule, I think, for the next meeting, because I think, Joe, you're talking about it looks like it's a long docket um, for the first first meeting in April, April uh, 5th. Well, uh, I yeah. need to say that's an election and I probably will not be here. Ooh. OK. That might mean uh, Mr. Baker, he might look at that as well. Yeah, I, I'll be volunteering. Uh, like you You'll be here, Commissioner Hill? Mm -mm. I'll be volunteering on election day, probably at one of the polls. Okay. So, uh, Joe, you might keep that in, in mind. Uh, I know I'll be here. Um, I would assume Commissioner Sadowski, okay. Commissioner Enders, Allender. I plan on being here. Okay. Uh, from my understanding, it's like, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I thought he said 30 cases. Oh, Maybe. yes. No. Oof. Bless y'all. <laughs> so, um, and here we are, we just did 12, you know, or, or that was on the agenda. So, and here we are, it's one o'clock or one fifteen. So really, if you want to take a break from volunteering, you can always come back and, you know, help out here and then that kind of thing. In any event, uh, please mark a calendar accordingly because it will be a long doc at some point, you know, just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, I think that's all I had for now. Commissioner Crow, just any update, Joe, any update with regards to when the water department's going to give us a overview on this new stormwater policy? April 15th, so your second meeting in April, and then they'll follow up in May. That's going to be kind of an overall um, discussion about stormwater management in general. And then in May, they plan to talk about the green infrastructure ordinance. Okay, great. Assuming that we have an agenda that accommodates it, we don't have all that applications in for May yet, so I don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. I'd just like to say I appreciated the update on KC Spirit today, too. That was great. Yep. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I make the motion to adjourn our meeting. Have a great uh, rest of the week. Second. Y'all right. take care. See Bye. you later. Bye.